I'm a Dutch girl in her early 20s. When I was younger, I had a best friend. We met in kindergarten and were immediately close. She was Ukrainian, but had moved to the Netherlands at the age of five. When we were about 13 years old, she started to get a little bit rebellious. One day, I was sleeping over at her house and her mother had to work until the middle of the night. In the afternoon, we went outside to take care of some horses we had under our care. We didn't own them, but we could ride them and brush or feed them with the supplies of the landowner. When we got back to her house, it was already dinner time. My friend Helena and I ate and went to play on the computer. That's when I got a notification on my phone. It was a text message. In those days, WhatsApp didn't exist yet. It was the days of texting and MSN. Anyway, the text message said something along the lines of, be careful tonight. Now we're obviously very confused and a little freaked out, but my friend didn't get scared so easily. She wanted to write back, who is this? But when we tried to open the message to reply, we couldn't find it. We found the message had somehow moved to the concepts map of my phone where messages are written on the phone itself, but not sent. Being young and naive, we didn't pay it much mind. We were watching TV when we started to doze off. Then I got another message, feeling sleepy yet. At this point, we were thinking someone was messing with us, or one of our friends happened to walk by her house. We didn't really send a reply back, but were more awake now than before. So we went outside for some typical teenage grocery shopping. We brought some snacks and energy drinks. At the cash register, I got another text saying, did you buy energy drinks? This felt very judgmental and aggressive. And being stupid teenagers, we did not take well to that. So we sent back, yeah, got a problem with that? The next text came back within a minute. Yes, don't buy them. We of course ignored the message and bought the energy drinks anyway. We then walked around our village and sat down at some swings near my friend's house, drinking our drinks. We then got a message. It said, no. We got a little suspicious there as it seemed to know what we were doing at all times like it was watching us. We went into her house, closed the curtains, and thought that that was that. But when we were inside, the strange occurrences got stranger. My phone kept sending me messages with some strange signs, like the ampersand and the percentage sign. I still remember that very clearly because it looked like dead smiley faces. We got very creeped out by this, but the messages kept coming in, fast, one after another. We wanted to tell our friends about this, so we started up her computer and the app MSN. But when we tried to type a message, all that came out were the same aforementioned symbols. We shut down the computer and went upstairs to her room. But before heading in there, Helena went into the bathroom to go take a leak. I waited in the hallway. She left the door open, as we were too freaked out to close it fully. She was on there when all of a sudden, the faucet from across from her turned on and water started filling the sink. She quickly finished up and went to turn it off. She washed her hands and was saying to me how strange that was when the door slammed on its own. She then began screaming like I'd never heard her before, and pulled the door open again. She ran into my arms, and we ran to her room together. We sat on her bed, huddled together for a while, and then I got another message. Getting scared now? At this point, I wanted to call Helena's mother, or my own. While I was making my case to Helena, she got very quiet and whispered, I know what to do. She told me 
To get our minds off it, we should go to the horses again. I followed her, but paid more attention to our surroundings. When we got there, she told me a story about last year. She and her niece were together that night, exactly one year ago, and they had found this stupid ritual online. They decided to do it in one of the fields near the horses, and use their blood to ask for the moon for luck. She said that nothing seemed to follow from it, but that it couldn't be a coincidence that it was a year ago to the day. She said that we had to do it again this year, in order to keep the promise she made last year. So we went to the field, and she cut her hand with a small knife she had hidden away. I told her this was insane, and that I wasn't going to cut myself for a crazy ritual. She told me that I was involved now, since I was getting the messages, and that I had to do it. Instead of my blood, I used my spit in a bowl for her to do the rest of the ritual. I honestly don't remember anything other than being so angry with her and thinking she was insane. On the walk home, she kept acting crazy and saying she was seeing all these people on the road that I didn't see. I told her to stop freaking me out. Thankfully, the messages had stopped. She then told me she saw a little baby, who was my brother. Now, I do have a brother who's passed away. I told her about him, and she did see the one picture of him that hung in my house. But other than that, she didn't know him. She told me about this tube around his neck. He did have this in his last years, and she could not have seen that on the pictures. I was confused, but more angry that she would use something like this to convince me of her story, and I told her that it wasn't okay, and stormed off. She caught up to me when we were nearing her house, and said to stop immediately. The urgent tone in her voice made me stop. She said a woman with a baby stroller was standing in her front yard watching the house. We hid behind the corner and looked. The woman was just staring at her living room window. Then I got another message. I told you to be careful. We texted back. What is happening? But got no response. After a while, the lady walked away. I guess she got tired of the empty house. We ran inside, checked all the doors and windows, and Helena looked outside and said there were people in the street looking at our house. I looked outside but couldn't see anyone. I told her I didn't believe her and she had to stop going into this creepy stuff. Then we got a message. Don't fall asleep tonight. Don't lose focus. Despite not being sure if I believed my friend about seeing people, I believed the messages I was getting were not normal. My friend then got all the Jesus-related statues and crosses from her house and put them in a circle in her living room. We sat in the room, hoping nothing would happen anymore, and we got another message saying, that's not going to work. Just then, a statue in the circle fell over and rolled away, breaking the circle. We ran upstairs, locked ourselves in the bedroom, and we sat on her bed for a while and dozed off. But then suddenly, Helena started screaming. She said that she saw a lady in a white dress standing outside her window. Her room had a small terrace and a ladder going down to her backyard. I looked out the window, but thank God there wasn't anything there. Then we got the final message of the night. Don't fall asleep. When the night is over, so will all of this. We didn't want to be in her room anymore and laid the mattress down somewhere else and fell asleep in a different room. When her mum got home, we told her we moved rooms because it was very drafty. She then went to bed and we didn't sleep until it was already well into the morning. We never got a text like that again. My friend wanted to use a Ouija board sometime after that, perhaps to get more answers. I told her she was insane, and that it wasn't even real, and why mess with things like that? No good can come of it, 
and we got into a huge fight, which led to the end of our friendship. To this day, I still don't know what was real, or was it possibly an elaborate prank, or perhaps my own imagination. I just want to preface this by saying the following actually happened. I've been lucky enough to have a few paranormal experiences in my life, and this happens to be one of those instances. When I graduated college, I moved back home into that weird post-grad limbo where I get a real job and try to figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life. In the meantime, I wanted one last summer of procrastination before I jumped into the real world. So I asked my friend to hook me up with a job at the local movie theatre. He had worked there for a couple of summers during school as a morning cleaner, running a shift from 4am to 10am every morning. It wasn't a great job, but it paid more than minimum wage which was pretty hard to come by in a town oversaturated with college kids. I interviewed and got the job when I was highly recommended by my friend. The guy who interviewed me would also be my manager, a scruffy guy named Jeff. He smoked like a chimney and made tank tops and cut off jeans a solid part of the wardrobe. He also looked like he hadn't had a good night of sleep in years, but that could have also been all the hard drinking he did every night. I remember he asked me the typical questions. If I was okay with working weird hours, cleaning up vomit, etc. I had worked in fast food as a teenager, so none of that stuff had bothered me. What struck me as odd was the last question he asked. Do you scare easy? I kind of laughed and said no. He shrugged and said, Well, some new hires get kind of spooked by these big buildings at night. You know how it is. Big building. It makes all kind of noises. Makes sense to me. I have a very active imagination. But I had a hard time being scared in a movie theatre of all places. I started my new job the next day. For the first few weeks, everything was pretty normal. The job was actually pretty easy. All things considered, throw this away, mop that, scrub this, wipe that, take out the garbage. You're by yourself the majority of the shift. We were allowed to bring our iPods with us. The theatre was fairly large. Its layout was shaped like a T, with the lobby and bathrooms in the stem. The smaller theatres on the left and the larger IMAX screens on the right. Running above the theatre hallway was the projection area, an equally long hallway with a couple of small offices and all of the projector equipment. If you were the first to arrive in the morning, you had to go up a winding staircase and turn on the lights in all the theatres. It wasn't a big deal, except with all the lights off. The building can be, as Jeff once described it, a little creepy. The projector area was full of promotional material, including a sea of cardboard cutouts from all the movies they have playing in the theatre. Sometimes, the theatre manager would have giveaways, and staff could take home some of the items. Pretty cool, but when the lights were off, it looked like a sea of people in the hallway. Another part of our job was to meet with the day crew after our shift at 10am and go over any maintenance problems we were dealing with, and they could highlight anything we needed to address on our next shift. The second thing to strike me as odd was the day manager, Bob, pulling me aside after my shift. You're the new guy, right? He asked. Yes? and he put a pair of keys into my hand. Can you make sure this place is locked up at night? I know you guys are usually in the back or upstairs. I don't want anyone sneaking in while you're occupied. I asked him if that was a problem. He looked a little flustered, and went on to explain that customers, 
primarily women, were complaining about a tall, lanky man in a suit that had been following several of them from theatre to theatre, sometimes into the bathroom. The last several months, several frightened women had come to the front desk, describing a seven-foot-tall man in a black suit, complete with bowler cap, walking slowly after them. A few times, even the police were called. Teenagers that worked the day shift referred to him as the tall man. While he primarily targeted women, occasionally a male co-worker would catch a glimpse of him, sneaking into a theatre. On a couple of occasions, they would pursue, thinking it was someone trying to sneak into a movie, only to find nobody there. We had 12 theatre rooms in total, but Theatre 5 was the worst. Nobody wanted to clean it out when I first started. I was fairly naive about what was going on, and didn't understand why Jeff was so apprehensive about Theatre 5, and kept assigning me to clean it out. What made Theatre 5 unique was that it was sat behind the bathrooms in the lobby, so to get to the sitting area, you had to walk down a long hallway before reaching the screening room. Being that far back, you were the most secluded, especially when it's 4am and the only other people you are with are on the other side of the building. People cleaning there would complain of nosebleeds, constant headaches, and a feeling of being watched. My first supernatural experience took place here. Theatre 5 always gave me an uneasy feeling, like I was being watched. On multiple occasions, I would take out my earbuds and shout, Hello? into the empty theatre. Of course, there would be no response and I would shake it off and just go back to my routine. One day, I was sweeping out garbage from under the seats when I hear footsteps. Someone running. I look down at the front of the theatre, and I catch a glimpse of a little blonde-haired boy turning the corner into the long hallway. Immediately, I threw down my broom and chased after him. I ran down the hallway and out into the lobby where the kid had disappeared. I walked further into the lobby and saw my boss outside the front entrance on a smoke break. Who was that kid? I asked. Jeff looked at me for a moment. He was confused, but then he laughed. I'll never forget how casually he said it. Oh, so you met Charlie. Charlie was another entity customers complained about. On several occasions, They claimed a little blonde-haired boy was running up and down the aisles in the theatre, causing all kinds of noise and ruckus during the movie. Of course, it was in Theatre 5. When an usher would come to apprehend the child, he'd be gone. The female staff affectionately named him Charlie, after his resemblance to the character in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Charlie was also responsible for knocking several cans of garbage over, throwing paper around, misplacing things, and making our janitorial duties a pain in the ass. Charlie wasn't frightening, just more of a nuisance than anything. We used to theorise that he was the son of the tall man, but these two were never seen together. It took that experience for Jeff to admit that some people have seen and heard some things, which was his way of saying that the theatre was haunted. I found it odd, considering the theatre was relatively new. It was built in the 90s, on some wetlands. According to some people that lived in the area, the property was owned by a family who sold it off back in the 1980s. There was no evidence of foul play, It wasn't an Indian burial ground. It was just a weird place where strange things happened. I didn't even realise there was a basement until my third or fourth week. The basement, as I was told, was primarily used for storage. I'd give you a better description, but that's as much as I know considering the one time I was asked to go down there. I didn't even know where the hell it was. 
It was a Thursday, and I was ready to get out of there. I remember that I had the next couple of days off, and I was ready to relax a little bit when I got home. I still had plenty of time on my shift, but this particular morning, I was really dragging ass. Jeff gave me a couple of bags and told me to drop them off in the basement. I said I didn't know where it was, and he pointed down the hall, last door on the left, marked employees only, he replied. I started walking away, and he stopped me. Don't go down there by yourself, he added, with a bit of hesitation. There's a lot of stuff down there, and I don't want you tripping over anything. There were usually only three of us working a shift. This morning it was Jeff, myself, and a co-worker named Trevor. Trevor was on the other side of the building cleaning out a theatre. I could hear his leaf blower running. Yeah, we use leaf blowers to blow the popcorn out the theatre. I didn't want to bother walking across the building to grab him. I figured, I'm an adult, and I can drop a few bags in a room for Christ's sakes. Jeff walks out the lobby to have a smoke, and Trevor is down at the other end of the building. I'm by myself, at the far end of a dark hallway. I open the door, and I'm looking at a long staircase that drops into the darkness. I flip the light switch to my left, and there's a light at the bottom of the staircase. It's flickering. Of course it's flickering. Nobody ever went down there to fix it. I heard a door open from the lobby. Jeff hadn't returned. I'm just hearing things. I look back down the staircase that I'm about to descend, where I hear a voice from the bottom of the steps. Hey. It's a low, raspy voice, and I pause. Hey. Come here, it says again. There's a shadow bleeding in from the bottom of the staircase. I can't tell what it is, but it's definitely a person. Hello? I call down. I don't know why I did. I know that I'm the only person on this side of the building. I know that there isn't just some person hiding out in a dark basement. At this point, my heart is pounding and I'm starting to sweat, because I know this isn't normal, and I'm experiencing something that shouldn't be happening. You gotta see this. Come here and look, it says again. The voice is a little louder. It sounds scratchy, like someone with a cold. The shadow is bleeding further into the bottom of the steps. Whatever's down there is coming closer. I toss the bag down to the bottom of the steps, turn off the light, and walk back down to the lobby. Jeff is walking back inside, reeking of cigarettes. I tell him about what happened. He has a look on his face that tells me this isn't the first time something like this has occurred. He almost looks irritated when I tell him I was going to go by myself. Nothing here is going to hurt you he said finally. I will never not be shocked at how casual he was about the whole thing. I think I was more taken aback by Jeff's reaction than I was by the actual incident. Later on, I told Trevor about what had happened. We went back to the steps to investigate, and when I turned on the flickering lights, the bags I had thrown down were gone. Theatre 5 had its instances, and the basement was particularly scary. But nothing was quite as bad as my experiences with the projector area. Around 6am, we would take a 30-minute break. Jeff and Trevor would usually go to McDonald's to eat, but it was always too early for me, so I'd lay in the hall and listen to my iPod. No matter how loudly I turned up the music, I could never cancel out the sound of the footsteps from the projector area. It sounded like a 300-pound lineback 
sprinting back and forth. Heavy, loud thumps up and down the hall above me. I told Jeff about it once, and he remarked that it was just the building settling, and there was a lot of equipment upstairs making all sorts of noise. Jeff wasn't the smartest guy, but that didn't stop him from insulting anyone else's intelligence. Maybe he was trying to keep me from quitting. The turnover rate was pretty intense at the theatre for cleaning staff, and the creepiness was a big factor. The pay was pretty garbage too, but that's a whole other story. So it wasn't before long I started feeling apprehensive about going upstairs to check the projectors and turn on the lights in the theatres below. On one particular occasion, I was walking up the steps to the hallway, and I heard what sounded like a child call my name from the bottom of the steps. I knew it was Charlie, because how many children are in the theatre at 4am? That was the first real instance of hearing my name. For a week straight, I'd hear voices echoing down the hall from the projector room, theatre 5, or down the hall. That was easy to ignore once I put my iPod on, but it never shook the feeling of being watched. I'd never seen the tall man in person. I had only ever heard instances where I encountered Charlie, heard noises or saw shadows. My only experience with it was at the start of my shift, when I was the first to arrive at work. If you're first, It's your job to go upstairs and turn on the theatre lights in the projector hall. I wasn't happy about it, but it looked like it was going to be another morning, where Jeff and Trevor were late, and I didn't want to mess up my shift by waiting around. Since the projector area is dark, typically, we'd carry a flashlight with us while going around flipping switches. That morning... I couldn't find the flashlight. We'd later find it in the garbage. Charlie's fault. So I walked through the dark hallway of the projectors, flipping all the switches. I had stayed up all night prior watching the Andy Griffith show. I remember because I was whistling the theme song to myself as I walked down the corridor. Once again, I got that feeling of being watched and something several yards away in the area with the projectors overlooking the IMAX theatre was staring back at me. I stopped whistling and tried to focus my eyes. It was a cardboard cutout. They were everywhere, so I kind of dismissed it and was about to flip the next switch when the cutout moved. I froze. What I thought was a cutout was actually a figure hunched over. It was quietly whistling the Andy Griffith theme song, imitating me, only whistling slowly. It slowly rose up from its crouch, revealing itself to be at least seven feet tall. It was a man. All I could see was a silhouette against the red exit sign lights and some of the projector computer monitors. It started towards me, whistling quietly. I wanted to move, but for some reason my feet were cemented in the spot, and I had cotton for a tongue. I didn't know what to do. Slowly the tall man stepped towards me. He walked with a bit of a waddle, as if he had a limp in his left leg. I couldn't exactly tell. He had taken about three or four steps towards me when something caught his attention, and he turned and walked into an office down the hall. I turned back and ran down the steps and waited outside the theatre until my boss and the rest of the crew arrived. I told them what had happened, and they explained that the tall man existed, but he wasn't going to hurt me. I didn't care. I put in my two weeks and haven't looked back. My gran died a few years back. She had been really ill for a while, and passed 
when she was in hospital, surrounded by my dad, two aunts and uncle, and my cousin around her bed. When the hospital staff were taking her away, my dad made sure all of my grand's personal effects were accounted for, so that nothing was lost or left behind when they had to leave. He took off her rings, her necklace, and her wristwatch, and gave them to one of my aunts. She put everything in her purse, but for whatever reason, she kept the wristwatch in her hand and just held it. Later, she realized that the watch had stopped working around the time of my grand's passing, give or take five minutes, which I guess gave the watch more meaning even if it was just a coincidence. A few days passed, and my aunt never put the watch down. We were all waiting in my grand's house for her to be brought back from the morgue. She was lifted up the stairs in her coffin whilst we were all waiting in the living room, and was placed in her bedroom next to her bed. We all got our turn to go and see her and pay our respects. And after I'd come out and saw my aunt sitting in the corner of the living room by herself, all of a sudden, the expression on her face changed from sad to shocked. But then she looked sort of comforted. She was looking at the wristwatch again, and it had started ticking. The hands had moved 20 minutes, the exact amount of time my grandma had been in the house. This still gives me goosebumps to think back on. I was performing in a play at my local community theatre. Before the play starts, or towards the end of an intermission, it's normal for someone on the stage crew, usually the stage manager or assistant director, to periodically poke their heads into the dressing rooms to let everyone know how long they have left until curtain up. The venue I perform with only has one dressing room, so both boys and girls use it at the same time. Meh, it's the theatre. We're all sitting around chatting, when the guy opens the door and does the call. So, one of the guys thought somebody was using one of the two bathrooms in there, and one was obviously empty. He knocks on the door and says, Two minutes, at least five of us. Me and the guy that knocked, and maybe three others, heard a female voice from inside clearly say, Thank you. After about 30 more seconds, when no one came out, he knocked again, and opened the door, and there wasn't anyone in there. There were no windows in that bathroom, and only one door opening into the dressing room. We were all standing there. The voice definitely had the echoing muffle quality that you'd expect to hear from someone in a bathroom. And the guy that knocked insisted he heard it coming from inside. Not only was he right next to me, and the door, but he's not the type of person to believe in paranormal occurrences. This story happened to me in 2015. I was outside one pleasant night, and all was calm. I was looking to the sky, admiring the stars to see how many constellations I could identify. If I'm being true to myself, the only constellation I've ever been able to find is the Big Dipper, and I have been told the Little Dipper is supposed to be exactly next to it. But alas, I've never found it. My eyesight is, however, not what it used to be. I was getting tired and getting ready to go back inside my house, when I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. Looking straight ahead of me in the distance, coming out of the woods, was what looked like two very bright eyes that were waist high off the ground. I didn't know what the hell it was, but it scared the crap out of me. These lights looked a lot like floating lanterns or balls of light, and were hovering. I've always had a bad feeling around that spot at night, but this was the first time anything actually happened. I ran back inside my house, and ended up staying awake for an extra few hours, 
trying to think of a reasonable explanation for what the hell had just occurred. I know numerous years earlier, a friend of mine and I were building a fort in the same area of the woods, when we came across a stone, with what looked like an ancient marking on it. We left it where it was, but thinking on it, I couldn't help but wonder if what we saw was linked to that stone. I told my dad about what had happened, and asked if anything had ever happened near that spot, to which he told me nothing that he ever knew of. I never ended up looking into it, and still think about it to this day. I never saw those lights again, and sometimes I wonder if it was all in my head. Nevertheless, it was scary. This second incident happened in 2015. I met a girl online, and things were hitting off fast. Her name was Madeline. Anyway, within a week, Madeline travelled all the way from Ohio to Maine, where I lived, and we planned to move in together back in her home state, Ohio. Anyway, we crashed at my house for the night, and left at 11am the next morning. I said goodbye to my parents, and we were off. Fast forward 15 and a half hours later, and we were in Ohio, and we were settled. We went to sleep for a few more hours, then spent the day together playing video games and having a good time. Madeline introduced me to her best friend Kelsey, and her fiancé Steve. Steve and I became really fast friends, despite him being 25 at the time, and me 19. This is where the scary part of the story comes in. Madeline and Kelsey started telling me about this abandoned train depot a few blocks away from the apartment where we were staying, and suggested that we go check it out at night. Steve wanted no part in it, so he stayed at the apartment. M called one of her other friends, Paul, and he agreed to meet up with us. Later that night at around 8, Madeline, Kelsey and I set off to meet up with Paul. We met up about a block away from the train depot, and then set off for the rest of the main attraction. Right before we got there, Paul chickened out, and turned around and went back, while the rest of us just laughed at him. We walked through the concrete lot, over the building and up a small set of wooden stairs, and everything was fine at least for a few minutes. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Kelsey starts to get a very bad feeling, like we were being watched by unseen eyes. Madeline started feeling it too, and I was starting to get freaked out as well. The air around us then began to get heavy, and Kelsey suggested that we get the hell out of there, which we did, only after going back down the stairs. Madeline became paralysed with fear, and a terrible stench filled the air. When Madeline was finally able to move again, we ran like hell back to the road, but the overbearing stench wasn't leaving. We ran several blocks, and still the smell persisted. It was almost like rotting meat, and we felt like we were being followed. This kept up the numerous blocks, until we were safely back at our apartment. Madeline was crying at this point, and wouldn't let go of me. Kelsey told Steve what happened, and he told us that we had attracted a demon. We vowed to never go back there again, although I did pass the place a few times on my daily walk around town, but nothing ever happened. Things were fine, then fast forward another week, and Madeline dumped me. I came to find out she was cheating on me with another guy, and by this point, I said screw it, and I hitched a ride back home to Maine with my aunt's boyfriend, who was passing through. When I was younger, my father worked a part-time job cleaning the local theatre after shows. Occasionally, he would let me tag along, 
and I would help him out for some extra allowance money. This building was built in 1916, and had been used as an auditorium and for formal dinners. Most areas slash floors, four floors and a basement, had been blocked or converted off by the 90s. This theatre had two screens, a huge first floor screen and a small upstairs one. We worked alone in this locked building. One night I was sweeping up popcorn in the bottom cinema while my father cleaned the stairs going to the top floor. I got about three rows of seats cleaned when what sounded like a baby started crying at the bottom of the rows. This was very loud and distinct. I froze. It lasted about ten seconds until I ran to my father. He looked and found nothing. It wasn't unusual for teenagers to try and sneak in for the night. On the last occasion I helped him, I was cleaning with my father in the small upstairs cinema. As soon as we walked through the door, something like a dark figure bolted for the fire exit around the corner, down a small hall. Those doors had alarms that were always set. This thing disappeared and didn't set off any alarms. Dad did a full search again, and nothing. I never went back to help him clean. My father said the theatre never bothered him, and whoever was there was just keeping him company. It probably helped that my father is deaf, and never had to hear what I did. The theatre is called Bad Axe Theatre, if anyone is interested. I don't believe in ghosts or spirits now, but my 11 to 12 year old self did not like that place. When I was 24, in 2006, I moved into a new apartment. I didn't notice any weird feelings or alarm bells when I first moved into the apartment for several months. I happened to go on vacation, and I told my girlfriend at the time if she wanted to do her study group with her college classmates, they could do it at my place uninterrupted. She said sure, that sounds great. I was out at the beach at the ocean, and when I returned to my place in the sand, I noticed I had several missed calls from my girlfriend. So I called her back to see what was going on, and she said that they weren't going to study at my place, and she would never stay there again with me, because she felt bad energy, and it was giving her the creeps. She said it was nothing aggressive, but there was something in that apartment. At this point in our relationship, we had never discussed any thoughts or ideas on paranormal activity, and I'm not a big believer in it. She said she never had that eerie feeling before in her entire life, and wasn't really a person that believes in paranormal. But in her gut, her body was telling her that there was something not quite right. After my two-week vacation, I returned home to my new apartment, and I did not feel or receive any type of eerie feeling at all. I chalked it up to that maybe she didn't like my new apartment, but just didn't want to come out and directly say it. Which is odd, because we're pretty straightforward with each other at the time. Skip ahead three days. I swear while I was sleeping, I heard an old lady say my name. Greg. It was like a loud whisper or a hushed tone, roughly three inches from my ear, like she was leaning over me when she said my name. It was definitely loud enough to wake me up out of a dead sleep. I glanced around and didn't see anything. Everything was normal considering I was groggy and half asleep, so I went back to bed. I thought about it in the morning when I woke up over breakfast and rationalized it as a part of a dream, and I don't remember the other parts of the dream. 
only that specific part. I'm not sure on what timeline, but around several weeks later, I woke up to the same exact loud whisper hush tone saying my name. I sat straight up instantly, and looked around, and listened. I again briefly rationalized it in my mind, with seconds in my groggy state, as having a nightmare of the original incident, or possibly deja vu. At this point, my girlfriend still refused to come and hang out with me at my place. I had not told her about the recent incidences during the nights that I had experienced there. So fast forward a few more weeks, and the same thing happened again in the old woman's loud hushed tone right in my ear. I instantly sprung up out of bed, and I can hear the sink in the bathroom running. That really creeped me out, because I have been sleeping for three or four hours, and I know I didn't leave the sink water running on full blast when I went to bed. At this point. I started to realize something was going on, and I could not rationalize it any longer. I called my mother at two thirty in the morning and told her I was coming back to stay at her house. I can't remember the excuse I used, but I made up some trumped excuse as to why I was staying, because I didn't want to tell her the real reason, figuring she'd laugh at me. Two nights later. I had the same thing occur for the fourth and fifth time, of this old lady saying my name, and waking me out of a dead sleep. I was really freaked out, and I yelled, "Leave me alone!" And out of nowhere, I heard a loud boom in the living room. I was scared to even open my bedroom door, frozen stiff, holding the doorknob. But my body and my mind are playing internal tugs of war. About opening the door to see what's out there, I had a four foot wide by three foot tall oil painting that my mum had made me back in high school. It had fallen off the wall and onto the couch. This was a heavy wooded framed oil painting that had been hanging there for almost two months with no issue. Suffice to say, I was scared shitless and called my mother again, and stayed at her house that night. The last experience I had was several days later. Not only was it the old lady's voice, but she said, "Listen to me, Greg," an elevated tone of voice that perhaps your mother would use if you were giving her trouble at the grocery store. Very stern. After all of this, I finally approached the landlord about this, and she told me the previous year a sixty-eight-year-old lady had died in the apartment. With that, I immediately broke my lease four months early, pay the money, and never look back. That is the only paranormal experience I've ever had in my life. In my mind, I'm a 24-year-old and a big, tough man who could handle anything, but that freaked me out beyond belief. I still, to this day, try and convince myself that the voice I heard was just running water, but I know better. I used to work at a movie theater. Last night I was closing, and had my first real paranormal experience. Around midday, we had to take care of cleaning a big theater. It was theater number one, and it was one of the bigger ones. It was just me and two of my coworkers cleaning it. Now this auditorium was pretty dark during cleaning. Because it had less lights on, because some had burnt out, and maintenance hadn't had a chance to change them. We were all in there basically in the dark, and I did something a bit ballsy. Being a skeptic, I thought it would be funny to jokingly call out to a ghost to show itself. Why is this ghost so lame and not showing itself? I said out loud to my coworkers. One of them was new, like me, and the other one was laughing, but said, "Nah, don't joke like that." So I apologized to the ghost and laughed it off, because I was still skeptical. As we were cleaning, the conversation suddenly died, 
and I heard the familiar buzz of a seat reclining in the theatre. I looked up from my broom, and all around, to notice my co-workers were doing the same. I was expecting to see one joking about, but we were all equally confused. There was no one in the theatre but us, but the sounds persisted for a few more seconds until they stopped. We began talking again to brush off the nerves, and a few times through the conversation we overheard it again from a few other directions. We just talked through it and ignored it. That same day, it was already past closing time. The people cleaning with me had left already, and I was stuck with the closing shift alone. The few people there were workers in the concession area, and the few customers in the theatres watching movies. I had to change the soap in the restroom dispensers, so I went in, as I knew I was alone in the restroom. The stall at the very end of the restroom we keep locked, because, at the moment, the toilet is broken. I'm changing the dispenser closest to said stall, and I get this odd feeling. Then I heard the locked door start to rattle, and bang, as if someone was in the stall. I freak out and loudly say, screw that, and rush out. I walk over to concessions while looking back at the restroom and get a co-worker to go in there with me. He checks the stalls and sees it's locked and empty, but there's no one in there but us. There's no way some breeze could have banged a door like that. I was about 15 years old when the following events transpired. It was the early high school years, and during this time my life was pretty horrible to say the least. Without going into too much detail, alcoholism was a major problem in my family, major depression, as well as poverty. Back then it was just normal life to me. I can't remember exactly when, but I remember starting to hear voices and knocking in the hallway and doorknobs jiggling on their own. Mind you, we lived in a double-wide trailer, so things are easily heard throughout most of the house. The voices and sounds became quite frequent, to the point where I would lie in my bed listening to the noises outside my door. As I listened, I noticed the voices were not voices at all, but just one voice, a voice of a woman. At first, I chalked it up to be my mother wandering around in a drunken stupor. The voices were unintelligible and droning, but had a tone of voice equivalent to someone just about to cry. This is where I screwed up, wrapped in thoughts of suicide and depression. One night I was like, you know what? Screw it. If there is something here, what better way to find out than to call it? So I performed a ritual to summon the spirit, or whatever it was. After some Google searches, this was a mistake. Post the performance of said ritual, things went on as usual, until one day me and my stepdad were sitting in the living room watching some TV, and we started to hear music. At first, it was quiet, and then grew extremely loud. It was the bass line to Another One Bites the Dust. At the same time, I can hear a woman's voice screaming over the music. Either that, or she was talking very loudly, or her voice was in the music. It was so loud that I yelled at my stepdad, like, what the hell is that music? Where is it coming from? He looked at me with a blank face, and I could read his lips. I can't hear any music. Shocked, I got up to investigate, and the music stopped. I mean, the blasting bass line stopped, and all returned to normal. Another incident was when I was outside doing some yard work close to the house, when suddenly I looked up, and saw a fog shadow person running towards the woods near my house, from the opposite side of the house, in which I was working. 
It was like a smoke person running for his dear life into the woods. Once it disappeared, it goes running after me. But once I reached the edge of the woods, it was gone. Still, at this point, I was more curious than frightened and could chalk it up to rational explanations. These next two events truly terrified me. I was awoken by the urge to pee one night. We usually kept the bathroom light on for my little brother, who was scared of the dark. As I approached the bathroom, I noticed that there was a woman's shadow on the floor coming from the open door of the bathroom. I thought it was my mum, so I decided to wait. As I made that decision, the shadow on the floor ran further into the bathroom. Mind you, this is a trailer, so the bathrooms aren't big enough to move at all. I was terrified, but had to pee more, so I enter. While I pee, the big door begins to open, and I say, I'm in here. The door stops. The door begins to open, and I quietly yell, I'm in here. The voices I heard, I will never unhear. I heard a soft, droning, playful voice say, I'm sorry. I went straight to my mum, who was asleep on the couch, to ask her if she had opened the bathroom door. When she said no, I shat bricks. Now, I had to face the truth, that I had been called by something, and that it was coming to me. No one else in the house had experienced anything. I tried mentioning something to my stepdad, but in an effort to make me feel better, he said it must be my mind due to the depression or our struggles. In that moment, I felt alone with whatever I had called forth, but nothing could have prepared me for what was coming next. Some time passed, and things were normal. Mind you, nothing was ever quiet. There were always knocks and doors moving, and her distinct voice. One night, I was lying in bed unable to sleep as usual. By this point I was jumpy, and constantly on edge. I wasn't telling anybody except for some high school friends, and even the other day, only those who I could trust. As I lay there in bed facing the wall, I heard her call my name from behind me. Before I thought, almost like a reflex, I leaped to face what called me. There before me was a woman, standing in my doorway. She had long, white, blood-stained Victorian dress. Her arms were by her side. She had long, straight black hair. Her face was not covered by her hair, but a dark abyss, as if her face was shrouded by a shadow. She stood there for a good two to three seconds before she went into the floor. I didn't sleep that night. After that, the house went quiet. Nothing paranormal ever happened again, and has ever happened to me again. I am currently a pastor of a church, and now, due to my beliefs and my experience, I do believe that she was a demon, sent on a mission against me, and that all that paranormal-style hauntings can be theologically proven to be demonic in different severities. I believe that God intervened that night, and that is why the activity stopped. I worked at a movie theatre, and there have been tons of accounts of paranormal activity. A manager has told me about their experience with seeing a full apparition and having unexplained things happen to them while there. I started working there back in October, and the place has just been renovated, so the whole lobby and the auditoriums are completely redone. I've always been interested in the paranormal, and have never really experienced anything, but recently some things have happened that I just wanted to chalk down as a coincidence, but have made me feel really uneasy at the time. A couple of weeks into the job, I was closing with a couple of other people. When we close, we have to wait for all the showings to end, 
so we can go collect trays after the last showings. We have four huge auditoriums and eight smaller ones. So we had just gone through one big auditorium, Theatre 3. It's got an eerie vibe compared to the other bigger ones. And a couple of us were just chatting in there while we waited for the next showings. I made mention of ghosts, since they've been working there longer than me. And they told me a few stories. While we continued on, about ghosts, a theatre light flickered. I didn't notice it, but they did, and told me. I just assumed they were pulling my leg. I was in the middle of mentioning some stories of a friend who previously worked there, when suddenly that light went out. We chuckled awkwardly, and I brushed it off as a coincidence. Well, fast forward to last week. I'm in Theatre 3 with one of the guy who's been there for a while as well. Naturally, I want to see if he has any experiences, so I ask. We talk about it, and I begin mentioning the light going out in the theatre. We're at the very top seats closest to the ceiling, and there's a light right above me that happens to go out as we discuss it. I awkwardly laugh and say, guess this number three is haunted, but I can't shake that it's a coincidence. A little later, I head to Theatre 6 alone, make sure it's empty and collect the trays. Theatre 6 is the theatre where the full apparition was seen. I'm walking across the last row, when suddenly the light above me goes dim. I glance around super quickly and notice no other light is affected. I talk and laugh to myself, screw that, and I rush out of there. I felt so nervous after that. I'm just curious if anyone thinks that was paranormal in any way, or if I'm getting spooked too easily. My name is Christy, and at the time of this series of events occurred, I was stationed in Yokosuka, Japan, as a Navy corpsman or military medic. It started in June of 1992, when I was 21, and continued until Thanksgiving 1993, when I was 22. But looking back, it's hard to believe that only 18 months could haunt the rest of my life. I have severe post-traumatic stress disorder from the first serving in the Persian Gulf War, 1990-1991, and reinforced by the events I am about to tell you. Thus, I have severe paranoia as well. I am on medication, and will be for life, despite the numerous rounds of counselling I have attended over the years. Also, Let me say that I come from a long line of women on my mother's side who can sense things. Most people can't. Normally I wouldn't mention it, but this comes important several times, and saved me from assault and death during this series of events. So it's important, no matter how sceptical you might be of it. Anyway, I lived in Japan on the naval base there, in the Corpsman Barracks, building 1407. My room consisted of a two-person open area, with a smaller closed room containing shower stall and toilet situated next to the front door. The front door led into the hall, and I lived on the third floor. My window looked out onto the hospital parking lot, and the back staff entrance of the hospital. Facing the hospital, the inside stairwell led down to the guard desk before going out to the parking lot. The opposite end of the hall had an outside stairwell which led onto a road and sea well overlooking the water. I had arrived in Japan of November 1991, and by the time June of 1992 came around, I had made many male friends amongst both of the hospital corpsmen living in the barracks and the enlisted servicemen off some of the ships in the dock. 
Most notably, I had become good gaming friends with a group of guys from the USS Blue Ridge, the command ship of the Seventh Fleet. Among these men was a tall, reasonably nice-looking man named James Vernon Dickey. He was a loner that others had seemed to avoid, though I couldn't figure out why. I figured he was just a loner and a bit strange, but harmless, so I would invite him to join in our games at the Enlisted Club, or A Club. No one protested the invitations, and Jim seemed to enjoy playing with us. Now, I was also extremely lonely. Despite my many friends, I was incredibly homesick. As a bit of pertinent information, let me just say that my two sisters were both pregnant while I was in Japan, but for reasons I shouldn't divulge, had asked me to take their babies if something should happen. I agreed, and looked forward to being a part of the children's lives, though hoped desperately it wouldn't be necessary to take on these kids, because that would mean something terrible had happened to either sister. This is very significant, because I was dreaming of a family of my own, with kids and such, but had no significant other. Then, Jim proposed to me, in June 1992. I jumped at the offer. I know, not the best reason to marry someone, but I could think of worse, so I agreed to marry him. I told my other friends, and they seemed hesitant and worried, but congratulated us. Well, except a Blue Ridge enlisted man we called Cowboy. He was Jim's best friend, and was genuinely glad for Jim and me. In fact, Cowboy was the only one who didn't see Jim as strange. I figured everyone else was nervous, because we'd only known each other for six months, so I shrugged it off. When Jim asked me when we should get married, I told him August. This made him happy, until I clarified that I meant August of 1994, over a year and a half away. I wanted to be married at my mother's house, like my older sister had. Jim frowned, and seemed disappointed and almost angry, but gave in to my wishes. Then Jim's behaviour began to get really weird. Though, at the time, I figured he had a strange sense of humour and didn't express himself very well. First off, we went to look for an engagement ring, and when we saw one I loved immediately, Jim claimed to have no money on him, so I bought the ring. We went next to the grocery store and picked up on $300 worth of snacks and drinks for my friends. I always provided this to encourage the guys to hang out at my place, instead of going out drinking. When we got to the counter, I realised I had used all my cash already for the ring. Without stopping or pausing, Jim called out, Christy, give me your ATM card. I'll go to get the money from your account. I handed it over, and he turned to the man at the register. I'm leaving her as collateral. He then walked out the door, never even asking for my password. The cashier looked at me with a very odd expression, and I tried to laugh it off. Well, I guess I'm worth about $300. He nodded, and gave me an uncomfortable chuckle, but didn't argue. The store wasn't busy, so there was no problem with me just standing there waiting. Jim came back in half an hour, paid the money, which upon later checking he had removed successfully from my account, and nothing extra was gone. And I didn't think much about the fact that he had known my password without asking. Soon, he brought over a new VCR, and claimed it was his engagement gift to me. I didn't even have one before that, so it was nice, but a bit odd. I didn't question the practicality, but I did get a bit peeved that he immediately sat down to watch a movie without consulting what I wanted to see. It turned out, he picked a film I didn't like, and I let it go, 
not wanting to fight over something so stupid. His next gift was a yellow rose in a water globe paperweight. It was beautiful. Yellow roses are my favourite flower. And this should have been the absolute perfect courting gift. But when he gave it to me, I had to force a smile. Because I didn't get the sense he gave it to me because I liked yellow roses. I felt like he gave it to me as a way to buy my interest. Again, I felt mean and silly. So pushed the thoughts away and displayed my new prize in a prominent place on my desk. Knowing I wanted to be a writer after the military, Jim told me his grandfather, whom he was named for, had written a popular book. I had never heard of a James Dickey before, so I just smiled and told him I thought it was really cool. I asked which book, and Jim did a double take. He paused, cleared his throat and mumbled, I can't remember. I figured it might have sold poorly after all, and didn't pester him. Now I wish I had researched this book a bit more, because it might have made a difference. But then I was young and fairly obstinate, so I would have probably ignored that warning sign as well. Within days, Jim brought over a Super Nintendo and stored it at my place. This didn't bother me as all my friends from the ship would leave valuables in my room. Joel left some expensive trinkets he'd acquired in the Philippines. Fear left Jade, and Cowboy even brought over his computer for safekeeping. The big problem I had with the Nintendo wasn't keeping it for Jim. It was Jim's use of it. If anyone came into the room at all while Jim was there, he immediately stopped talking to me and went to turn on either Final Fantasy II or Sim Earth. Everyone tried to include him in game and conversations, but he seemed to lose all interest in the games we used to play at the A Club. He wouldn't talk, not even greet people. As soon as we were no longer alone, Jim withdrew. I figured he was shy, but couldn't figure out why he'd become so badly shy when these were all our common friends. Cowboy, a real sweetheart with a serious alcohol problem. Elf, a Blackfoot shaman. Seal, a pacifist who couldn't pass the seal exams. All people he'd known from before the engagement. Even my corpsman friends had trouble talking to him, though they tried their best. Chris, who worked the emergency room on third shift, and lived on the first floor overlooking the water, was the kind of guy who would get anyone to laugh or relax. But even Chris's legendary charms had no effect with Jim. I went through two roommates, but Jim was as antisocial when it came to females as he was with males. Sometime, in July of 1992, Jim and I went out walking holding hands. We saw a couple, apparently friends of Jim's, as he seemed eager to introduce us. Jim led me directly over to them and introduced me. He then said, See? I can get anything I want. I even got her to agree to marry me. He seemed very pleased, but the other couple just looked nervous. They laughed it off, and the conversation somehow got onto the subject of God. Again, Jim acted oddly, this time saying, Oh, I'm not God, but I can take him in a fight. I could see how freaked out the other couple was, so made some comment about Jim's sense of humour. Jim glanced at me quickly, then gave me an odd laugh, and agreed he had been joking. The other couple walked away at that point. Even though it had been weird and uncomfortable, I was relieved Jim hadn't just ignored the other people, so let it go. July of 1992. Our hospital was put on a health fair. I worked in the gynaecology department and volunteered to run the display for our clinic. I was told to do a display concerning domestic abuse, focusing on the domestic violence and how to spot it. Thus, when the day came, I set up the flyers and research and such, and sat down. 
Jim came over and sat behind the table without permission. My supervising nurse saw him and frowned, telling me he shouldn't be there. I covered for him by saying, Oh, he's here to help, so men feel better about stopping to look over the information. She accepted that and handed him a clinic t-shirt to put on, so he'd look like he'd fit in. As the nurse walked away, Jim asked if I had to sit there all day. I told him I did, and he grew quiet, frowning. Finally, he picked up a flyer on the ten most common signs of domestic abuse and began to peruse it. He seemed vastly absorbed in what he was reading. As I hadn't prepared the flyer, I had no idea what it said, so I grabbed one as well to read. My relationship with Jim fit nine of those ten signs. I worried that I might be facing something abusive, but then told myself that since he had never laid a hand on me, as the tenth sign was physical abuse, that my relationship must be the exception that proves the rule, and I put my worry to the back of my mind, but promised myself that if Jim ever tried to hit me, everything was over. I looked up to find Jim watching me intently, gave him a smile, and put down the pamphlet. He tossed his on the table and walked away. I didn't see him for the rest of the day, but felt relieved. Many little things, such as what I've already described, happened, but mainly he ignored everyone, including me, if we were not alone. Over the months, both of my sisters managed to resolve their situations and I no longer needed to be their backups for child-rearing. Rather than lift the responsibility from my shoulders, I became suicidal, thinking I was not needed. I felt like I would just be in the way, and I began walking in front of cars in the middle of the night in an attempt to die. Thus began my first round of counselling sessions. However, nothing in counselling prepared me for what would happen in the summer to fall of 1993. I think it was in July of 93, Jim came to my room to tell me that the Blue Ridge was shipping out to Vladivostok, Russia, for a few weeks. He said this was the first time an American ship would be allowed there since the Cold War had begun in the 1950s. I can't be certain anymore, as when last week I tried to look up those exact dates on a Blue Ridge duty assignment listing, the Blue Ridge was listed as having gone there in 1996, not 1992 or 3. At the time, I had no reason to doubt Jim and was very excited for him. He said he wanted to spend the night with me. Immediately, I got the uncomfortable feeling that Jim wanted to sexually assault me. Not have sex, but sexually assault me. I pushed the suspicious thoughts away, putting it down to my paranoia from PTSD, the war, and my still feelings of uneasiness. I agreed to let him spend the night at my room, since I currently didn't have a roommate, and told him to use my bed, which was in the far left corner tucked between my desk and a pair of tall entertainment centres. I would sleep in the empty bunk, which was open to the entire room and close to the light situated on the unused desk. My bed was a typical bunk, while the other bed was raised a foot or so extra off the floor. He had tried to talk me into sleeping with him, but I said he had to rest for the duty tomorrow. I told him I didn't feel well, and didn't want to get him sick. Finally, he grumbled in agreement, and dropped into my bed behind the convenient barrier. I literally had to climb into the spare bunk, but did so, turned out the light, and settled back. As soon as the room was dark and I was comfortable, I began to drift off to sleep. Though I could feel waves of anger and hate coming from the rear end of my bed. This troubled me, as I'm usually pretty good at detecting someone's mood. I thought maybe Jim was pissed at me but I gradually became aware that the negative feelings were not coming from Jim. They were between us and aimed in Jim's direction. 
I felt like someone was standing by my head in a protective manner, thinking bad things at Jim to keep him at bay. That had never happened to me in my barracks room before, though it had happened other times, but that's not pertinent to this series of events, and it never had happened in Japan. I let my eyes drift shut, trying to ignore the hostile entity I knew was protecting me. Suddenly, the foot of the bed pressed down with someone's body weight. Whoever it was began to crawl up the bed over me. I was annoyed with Jim and a bit afraid of what he intended, and I called out, Jim! From the far corner, his voice, clear and awake, came back. Yeah? The body was still over me, and it wasn't the entity near my head which was seemingly focused on Jim. I flipped on the light, and the mattress returned to normal. The feeling of a body over mine was gone. I was alone on my side of the barrier, calling out. I told Jim, Never mind, I thought I heard something. How could I tell him what happened? especially since the feeling of impending doom and sexual assault had come within sensation of someone crawling into bed. I turned off the light, and the bed pressed down again. Someone began crawling up my body once again. Nervous, I called out for Jim, who answered from the other bed, just as awake as before. I flipped on the light, and the pressure left. Again, I told Jim I thought I heard something. I hesitantly turned out the light. Whoever it was returned, instantly crawling in from the foot of the bed. I didn't wait this time. I turned on the light, grabbed a robe, and sat at the desk with a book. Jim sat up, glared at me, and asked me what I was doing. I told him I couldn't sleep, and would read a bit. He grumbled and turned over falling asleep quickly. I stayed up all night, not daring to turn the light out or to go to bed. I knew that whomever had crawled into bed was trying to keep me up, and I knew that the second I drifted off, Jim would get to me. It wasn't a minor feeling, it was a dead certain dread. I couldn't wait to get Jim out the room, In fact, that was the last time he was permitted to sleep over. Somehow, I didn't trust him. Shortly after the Blue Ridge returned from wherever they had gone, Jim and Cowboy came over. They discussed what movies they should watch. I wasn't feeling well, and I really just wanted to read quietly to myself. But I didn't feel right kicking out these guys who had been at sea for two weeks. Cowboy mentioned wanting to watch a horror movie, not my favourite genre, and Jim said he wanted it to be super scary. I put my foot down at that and said I didn't feel up to horror. I thought I would get nightmares. Jim suddenly frowned and turned to Cowboy and said, Yeah, nothing horror. I might start acting... Weird. His pause was almost more disturbing than his words. I was instantly angry that, once again, he was using me as a way to manipulate people, or claim his evilness, just like with that couple, and several other times in our relationship. I squashed down my temper, and merely told them, watch whatever, I'm reading a book. They left shortly after. A few days later, Cowboy and Jim showed up with one of our other friends, Elf. He's a Blackfoot shaman. Cowboy was drunk and unfortunately depressed. He opened my window and started trying to climb out to attempt suicide. Jim, thankfully, was quick enough to catch the guy and wrestle him to the ground. Elf locked the window and frowning, said he could get Cowboy to sleep it off. So they put him in my corner bed, and soon enough Cowboy was sleeping. I don't recall how Elf did it, 
because the next bit trumps it in my memory. Elf mentioned being able to heal people and do psychic surgery. He mentioned that Cowboy needed some psychical help, but he had to wait until Cowboy was sober and could voluntarily participate. Jim asked if Elf could heal him, since he was feeling evil. Elf looked him over doubtfully and said that he was pretty sure he could help. Jim climbed onto the spare bunk and lay down with his eyes closed. I asked Elf what I could do, and he told me to stand back and watch. He told me to shut my eyes and look at Jim's aura and tell him what I saw. I did so and saw a murky green light enveloping Jim. His aura seemed off to me, but I didn't know why. I've never done much research on auras and didn't know how it should have looked like. Elf told me to keep my eyes closed as he prayed. He said that when he was done, Jim should have a white aura instead. It was a long time of Elf praying in his native language, and me trying to watch through closed eyes, before the green grew much smaller. Finally, Elf said it was over, but his voice sounded troubled. I wondered what had went wrong, because there was no white light just a smaller murky green one in Jim's core. Elf loudly said he was too tired to do anything more that day, and asked how Jim felt. Jim sat up, and claimed he felt like a new man. As Elf passed me on his way to leave, he whispered that the light only grew smaller, not changed. He nodded and said he couldn't fix it. Something was evil there. Elf left and soon after Cowboy awoke, and Jim took him back to the ship. Again, I ignored the warning signs. I was engaged to the man, lonely and feeling useless and desperate. So I brushed aside the warnings from a full Blackfoot shaman that my fiancé was evil. I figured something merely went wrong, and I wouldn't worry about it. I don't recall Elf ever coming over after that. It was about this time that Cowboy started calling me practically every weekend. He would be drunk at the A-Club and needed someone to bring him home. I inevitably ran out there to help my friend, and often Jim would come with me to fetch Cowboy. We'd bring him back to my room to sober up or sleep it off. Chris, my friend at the ER, told me I had to start calling an ambulance for Cowboy. He insisted that my going to get him only encouraged him to get drunk. Chris insisted, Cowboy needed professional intervention to get better, not coddling. Cowboy called again, in August 1993, to ask for my help. Jim and I went to get him, much to Chris's disgust. We brought Cowboy back, and Cowboy locked himself in the bathroom. He then lay up against the door and started trying to cut his arms open with my safety razor. Finally, Chris and Jim got the door and pulled Cowboy out. We took him to the ER, and that was the last time I went to get him. I always called an ambulance for him after that, but this was significant to things to come. Cowboy didn't hurt himself too badly with the razor but it had been quite evident that one of my friends trying to suicide would drive me to do whatever I could for him. Jim apparently never forgot that. September 1993 came, and I was assigned a new roommate. She was a 19-year-old girl named Yvette, and came from East Los Angeles. When we first met, she bragged how she never locked her doors in her life, because... Nothing ever scared her. That afternoon, Jim showed up for a few hours. When he left, Yvette immediately locked the door behind him. I laughed and teased her about never locking doors. She turned to me, her face pale and serious, and said, I know you're engaged, but that man creeps me out. Startled, I began to mentally review my relationship and all the odd events. Painfully, 
I came to the decision that this tough girl I'd known for half a day was entirely correct. Jim was creepier than hell. It took a total stranger to point out to me what my own eyes could not. Later that week, I told Jim that we should postpone the engagement to get to know each other a bit more. And that's when things got extremely scary. And the order of the events are a blur to me. Yvette worked third shift with Chris at the ER, while I worked first shift at a clinic. Thus, when Yvette got home in the morning, I would be leaving. One of us would lock the door, and I wouldn't come back until mid-afternoon. We'd spend some time with friends or whatever. Then Yvette would get ready and leave for work. One of us would lock the door. I'd go to bed at that time. One day, I got a call at the clinic, just after noon. Yvette was hysterical and insisting I come home. I may have been military, but I managed to get permission to run back to my room, which was just outside the back of the hospital, as you might recall. When I got into the room, Yvette was crying and sitting on her bed. She explained that she had woken up around noon to find Jim in the room. He was messing with the stuff under my bed, but she couldn't tell exactly what he was doing. When he noticed that she was awake, he got up and walked over to her and started asking weird questions. He asked things like, When do you leave for work? When do you get home? When does my fiancé leave for work? When does she get home? When are you alone? When is she alone? She got more and more frightened until she finally managed to convince him that she had to sleep for work. He left and she locked the door. Then she called me. We weren't able to figure out who had forgotten to lock the door. So after that, we both made sure to check when leaving and entering. My supervisory corpsman called me into her office one day and, really annoyed, asked me about Jim giving me a VCR. Confused, I confirmed he had. She then said that Jim had called her in the middle of the night at home to ask where his VCR was. She didn't appreciate being woken up by him about something so stupid. I told her the VCR was a birthday gift. Yes, it was an engagement gift, but a gift was a gift and I'm sure as hell wasn't going to give it back after he bugged my supervisor about it. She frowned and said she'd take care of things and sent me back to work. I still don't know how he got her phone number. I didn't even have her number and I worked for her. Until I changed clinics, he called every couple of days asking for his VCR or asking if I knew where it was but she always insisted to tell me that she was handling it. Then I was switched to the general practice clinic, including sick call, and I didn't hear any more about the VCR for some time. Now Jim was terrorizing everyone I called a friend except Cowboy. While I was walking to lunch with Roy White, as we shared a lunch shift, Jim passed us in the hallway and elbowed Whitey in the face. He would regularly start beating on Seal, who would never fight back or even report it. Jim began trying to corner Chris at his front door practically every day, so Chris wound up using his window as a way to enter and leave his, thankfully, first floor room. Finally, I got sick of this and told Jim that the engagement was off. I told him that we could still be friends if he left everyone alone, but I wasn't going to marry someone that behaved this way. He asked me why we couldn't talk about things, but I insisted that it wasn't going to help. He stepped up the terrorizing, but this time he would call my boss or corner Chris saying he wanted to talk to me. After only a few more days of this more intense terror for my friends, I met him at the clinic while I was working. My boss agreed to give me a few minutes to talk to him. I explained to Jim that I could see him for lunch the next day in the hospital gallery to talk, but it couldn't be before then. 
I was going to get a shower right after work, then go to dinner, then go meet my former nursing supervisor and our exercise group for our mandatory bi-weekly run. Afterwards, I'd be getting another shower and going directly to bed. Feeling I had explained my schedule precisely to him, I asked if he was okay with meeting me for lunch the next day. He agreed and left, frowning but quietly. When I got home from work, Jim was at my door. He asked me why I wouldn't talk to him. I sighed and again told him my precise schedule and that I couldn't meet him until the next day for lunch. I said he had an hour to talk to me then. He agreed and walked down the hall towards the inner steps, which led to the guard deck and hospital entrance. Yvette had gone out with friends, so I was alone at last. Relieved, I went to my room and began gathering my clothes for the shower. Not five minutes later, a knock came on the door. I answered it, and there stood Jim. He asked why I couldn't talk to him. Surprised and a bit annoyed, I explained my schedule once more, thinking that he was being especially stupid about the entire thing. I told him I really couldn't talk even at dinner because my schedule that night only allowed for a 15 minute dinner break or I'd be late and the exercise group was mandatory. I shut the door and he walked away and I began to strip for my shower. Walking into the stall, I turned on the water, testing it, and a knock came at the door. Stunned, I knew it was Jim. By then I wasn't annoyed, I was scared. Why couldn't he understand and let me go? I stayed in the shower, but turned off the water so I could hear. I didn't trust that he wouldn't be able to get in somehow. I still never fully reconciled who had left that door unlocked when he terrorized Yvette. For half an hour I stood shivering and nude in the shower, listening to Jim knock for a while, and then stop and start again and stop over and over. I don't know why I didn't get dressed or call security. Even seeing someone out of the corner of my eye in the store with me didn't spook me, as I figured it was the same angry guy from the last night Jim slept over. I had never seen someone in the shower with me before, but that night there was someone there. Though this time I was too scared to try and sense whatever the entity was feeling. I just stood there hugging myself shivering wet and scared to death. Finally, the knocking on the door was accompanied by a voice shouting, Let me in! It's Chris! Suddenly, relief washed over me. The entity disappeared. I grabbed my clothes and put them on, not bothering to dry off. I unlocked the door, expecting to see Jim with Chris in the hall. But Chris was alone. I pulled him in and locked the door, tears streaming down my face. He asked the question I'd been hearing for the last week or more. Why won't you talk to Jim? I knew Chris was one of the people who despised Jim the most. He'd even told me, after the breakup, that he'd never liked Jim and had only been tolerant for my sake. That actually seemed to be a popular opinion amongst my corpsman friends. So I described to Chris the events of the day. Quietly, he offered to distract Jim while I ran out the back stairs to meet my exercise group, which I was late for. I took him up on the offer and watched him walk to the inside stairwell and talk to someone out there on the landing. That's when I knew Jim had been watching for me to leave the room and waiting. I was terrified. I ran out the door, forgetting to lock it, I'm sure, and headed down the outside steps. I ran full tilt to the row of shops where my group met, but no one was there. I had been so looking forward to being in a group, with safety. Turning, I started up Officers Hill, where the Married Officers BOQ, or housing, was but realized that Jim knew my running route, and being the fastest runner on the Blue Ridge would have no problem catching me up. I was terrified that he would find me, though I had no idea what he might do, but I didn't want to be alone with him to find out. 
Turning back down the hill, I ran along the water road towards the hospital, taking the risk that Jim had either gone to find me en route, or was still on the inside landing and therefore couldn't see me run past the barracks. I ran past the hospital and down the front drive, heading the reverse of the running route, hoping to meet up with my group. I was never so glad to see my lieutenant supervisor as I was in that moment. I ran over to her, ignoring the group, and told her what had happened. She dismissed everyone else and had me tell her again, slowly. Finally, she said the one thing I didn't want to hear. You're overreacting. Go home and rest. It'll be fine. There's no reason to be afraid. You're taking it out of context. It was like she had slapped me in the face. Shocked, I turned and went home, making sure to use the outside steps to get to my floor, just in case. I locked myself in and cried. The next day, I reported sick instead of working and was permitted to go back to my room to rest. The new supervisors understood what had happened without my even telling them. I never got over what the lieutenant had said. Later, I found out she had gone immediately to security and reported Jim's stalking behavior, as well as telling my new supervisors. She was terrified for me. In fact, she'd only said what she did to try and calm me down, because she had never encountered a stalker before. But she didn't calm me down that day. Instead, she broke my trust. That day, Jim did not show up to our lunch appointment, though I did leave my room to show for it. He came by later, but I told him we couldn't be friends since he couldn't trust me. I told him I'd missed dinner and my mandatory exercise because of him and was in trouble at work. He said nothing and left. Then I felt immense relief. It was finally over. Little did I know, it was only the calm before the storm. Thursday of that week, late September, I was sitting watch desk for the barracks. This watch runs until 11.30 at night, but I would often stay down there, still in uniform, until one in the morning, talking with friends or playing pool in the next door lounge area. That night was no different, as I felt safer in the crowd. Scott and Ron, two other corpsmen friends, were there as well with Seal. Cowboy was on restriction for a drunken rampage in Guam, so I hadn't seen him for a few days. Chris and Yvette were on yet another midnight shift. Another more casual corpsman acquaintance was there. His name was Dave, and he was fairly new to the duty station. We were talking and laughing, and having general fun in a restricted kind of way since I was on duty. Basically, I got to sit at a desk and do a roving patrol every hour. Jim suddenly showed up, and the mood shifted to somber. It felt as if the guys were gathering round me protectively, without even leaving their seats. I think Rom was even sitting on the desk, filing his nails. Jim said he needed to talk to me in private, so I took him to the next room, which was the general lounge and phone room. I left the door open so the others were really close. He wanted to shut the door, but I told him he had to leave it open since I was on watch and technically shouldn't even leave the desk. He said he was sorry for what had happened between us, and that he was depressed. He felt like he was in danger, and needed company back to the ship. I said okay, and went back to the other room, and asked if someone would be willing to walk Jim back to the ship. Nobody spoke up, and Jim frowned and said he wanted me to walk him to the ship. I told him I couldn't do that because I was on watch, and he said he felt like he might walk in front of cars or something. I was instantly terrified. I felt like he was trying to get me alone, to sexually assault me or perhaps kill me. For the first time in my life, the thought that he actually might kill me came up. I insisted I wasn't allowed to leave, and that I was extended late that night 
due to some thefts in the barracks. Instantly, Ron, Scott, and even Dave piped up in support of my lie. Bless those men. I told Seal to please walk Jim home, even though I knew Jim would beat the living shit out of Seal for interfering. But I felt Seal being beaten up was better than me getting murdered. So I squashed my guilt and insisted. Seal, ever the consummate gentleman, stood to obey my direct plea. Jim got angry and said he did not need Seal babysitting him. And I asked if Jim felt like he was in danger. No, I'll go by myself. You'll regret this. Jim left. Then I asked Seal to follow him to make sure he got home safe. Seal agreed and left, but was very unhappy. I wondered if I had lost a friend that night. Finally, 11.30 came back around and I went to my room, instead of hanging out longer. Not much later, a knock came to the door. It was Seal. He wanted to talk to me. We spent the entire night talking and playing with Cowboy's computer. When the dawn came, Seal seemed stunned and claimed he had to muster. He opened the door, and Yvette stood there looking exhausted, holding her keys out. She smiled at Seal, everyone liked Seal, and passed him as she walked out. She looked at me and I said, We talked all night. Jim tried to get me to go with him last night. I'm going to bed. I rolled into my bed and took off my glasses, which instantly blurred the room. I heard Yvette unzip her ER jumpsuit, which I knew she only wore undies underneath, and she kicked off her shoes, and then another knock came to the door. I called out, Seal probably forgot something. Give him whatever it is and tell him I'm asleep. I couldn't see anything but a blur of colours. I heard her open the door and say, Oh, it's you. She sounded utterly disgusted. Is she home? Jim said. I stiffened and pretended to be asleep, eyes closed and breath held. Yvette paused, sounding less hostile and answered, No, she's asleep. What do you want? Never mind. Immediately, Yvette screamed, Jim! and took off running out of the door in socks and an unzipped jumpsuit in near nudity. I crammed my glasses on and opened the window, not knowing what had happened. I saw Seal in the parking lot and screamed, Seal, catch Jim! Yeah, it would be useless for him to try. As I said, Jim was the fastest runner on the Blue Ridge at the time, but I didn't think about that. I turned away from the open window as Seal bolted off. Yvette limped back in and said that Chris was also chasing Jim. She zipped her jumpsuit up and shoved her feet into her sneakers. She then glared in my direction, but I don't think she was glaring at me specifically. She said, he slit his wrists. Yvette ran back out the door. I picked up the room phone and called an ambulance, and I tried to explain that Jim had slit his wrists and was stationed on the Blue Ridge but he ran off and I wasn't exactly sure where he was. They took the information down and after a while told me they couldn't do anything without his location. They said to try security, but to call back if Jim showed up. Yvette came back and I tried security again, just as Chris and the next door neighbor, a new guy called John, came in. Security already knew about Jim from the ambulance crew and told me they had dogs searching for him. He was considered armed and dangerous. I was stunned and said that Jim wasn't known to carry a knife until that day. They told me they'd stay in touch. Seal came back in, late for muster, and panting hard. He said that he had lost Jim, but that Jim had turned off towards the Blue Ridge. I passed the info to security, and hung up. That's when I noticed Chris was swearing. John asked what had happened. Yvette said, Christy was in bed trying to sleep when Jim showed up. He's her ex-boyfriend. I opened the door and he slit his wrists and then asked for Krista. 
which is what he calls her. I didn't see any blood, so I told him she was asleep. Then he said never mind, and turned, but as he turned I saw blood. He bolted and I tried to stop him, but I was only in socks. Chris swore again and said, Slit his wrists, my ass. I'll show him how to slit his wrists. I'll show him how to slit his throat. Chris's feet were bare, and I could only imagine the pain of running outside after a man he despised. Seal sighed and apologised, but said he was already late to muster, and had to leave. We let him go. Not long after, a knock came to the door. Chris opened it. It was Jim, looking very calm. Chris dragged him in and began taking care of the injury, which was actually on the fleshy part of Jim's palm, and so was not in the least bit dangerous to him. This seemed to piss Chris off even more, and he kept swearing but very softly. He was the ultimate professional in treating Jim's wound. He asked where the knife was, and Jim claimed to have lost it. Jim then mentioned that he'd washed his wrist off in a bucket of green liquid somewhere. Chris gave him a startled look, which turned into a glare and he stated, Not antifreeze. Jim guessed he was right. John said he had to go next door for something and left. After a brief pause, I said I needed to ask John something and went next door. Without knocking, I walked in and used his phone to call security, ignoring a rather embarrassed John who was using the bathroom. Poor guy must have thought he'd move next to the loony bin. Security was surprised when I told them Jim had returned without the knife that he claimed. They said that they were just entering the first floor guard area and they were on their way up. They ordered me to get everyone out the room and leave Jim in there. I went back next door where Jim was sitting on the floor with a box of Sunday comic clippings my mother had sent me. He was reading calmly. Without my having to say anything, Chris and Yvette left, taking John with them and heading for the lounge. I sat down, not wanting Jim to leave before security could get there. After a long moment, Jim nonchalantly said, This is your fault. I told you something would happen. You should have gone with me last night. It's your fault I'm hurt. I didn't know what to say, and still don't know if I responded at all. I knew he was playing on my sympathy for depressed friends on my own suicidal ideolations. Hell, he'd even used my own suicide attempts against me by claiming he felt like walking out in front of cars the night before. Fortunately, security showed up and kicked me out the room. They made me go to the lounge while they arrested Jim. They took him to the hospital and had him admitted to the psych ward for observation. If all went well, and the doctors felt him safe, Jim would be released at noon next day. I was utterly convinced that would never happen. One of the security guards, military police actually, told me I needed to get a restraining order against Jim. He was adamant I'd do this. Then I was left alone and decided maybe I should take his advice. I'd go on Monday when the office opened. Unfortunately, the next day, a Saturday, the phone ringing woke me up. Yvette had just gotten home, so it was perhaps 7.30 or so. I answered, and it was Dave on the morning barracks watch. He asked if Jim had anything in my room. Confused, I told him that Jim had Nintendo, games and movies there. Dave went on to explain that Jim was asking for his stuff. He said he'd distract him while I got it together. I checked the clock. There was no way it was noon. He couldn't have been released already. Panicking, I started collecting his things. Yvette helped me, and we brought these things down the inside stairs. Dave stopped us on the landing of the second floor. He wouldn't let us go any further and took the stuff. Just as he took the stuff down to Jim, 
security showed up and arrested him again. Since I didn't have a restraining order, the charge was escaping the psych ward. He had actually broken out the ward to come back to my place. The same security guard from the day before was angry and asked me why I hadn't gotten an order against him. I told him I was doing it on Monday, but the office would have been closed the night before. The guard informed me that the office was open at all times for something like this, and he insisted I go down and get the order right then and there. I went to the office and got the order. Most restraining orders are for 100 feet or 300 yards. He mentioned that he had given me the 300 yards or 900 feet, and that Jim wouldn't be allowed on the same street, even across the road from me. I figured that was normal, and thanked him, relieved that I had this order. By the time I got home, Dave told me that Jim was being confined to the psych ward on the Blue Ridge for at least a week. He asked if I was sure I got everything of Jim's, and I told him I was positive. The next day, Sunday, I brought a badly beaten seal with me to the security office to get a restraining order. But at the last minute, he balked. They wouldn't give it to him unless he signed, and he refused because Jim was a higher rank. Seal was odd like that. He wouldn't disobey anyone of a higher rank, even if the order was abusive. Two days later, I finally got to see Cowboy, who was troubled by everything he'd heard from Jim. He said Jim had told him we'd broken up. Cowboy had repeatedly encouraged him to get me to talk to him and not give up. I was horrified. Poor Cowboy had been behind Jim continually harassing everyone, but he didn't even know it. I knew Jim would never explain the truth, so I did keeping nothing back, letting Cowboy know what his best friend had been doing for the past few months. Cowboy was horrified and began to cry. I forgave Cowboy. Jim had used him. On the fourth day of Jim's incarceration, I was jogging by the ships, secure in the knowledge that Jim wouldn't be out of there to harass me. A young man in dungarees was also running, and he said hello to me. I politely struck up a conversation, and it turned out he was a corpseman from the Blue Ridge. I hesitantly asked if he knew a man by the name of Jin Dickey, fishing for information on how the psych thing was going, trying to gauge my safety. The corpseman snorted, and said he knew Jim, and he'd been watching him in the psych ward for the last three days. He went on to say, that bitch who got him locked up lied. He's not crazy. He's perfectly calm and sane and a really nice guy. I broke into instant tears and practically yelled, I'm not a liar. I then went on to tell this guy exactly what Jim had put me through. The corpsman seemed stunned and soberly said, I already signed off his release early last night. I hightailed it back to my room and locked myself in. Terrified, the entire thing would start again. I no longer felt like the order would protect me. Jim was being transitioned out of the Navy at this point for what he did to me. He was supposed to get on a plane and leave for the States to process out, but delayed this for more than a month. He kept re-injuring his toe. I think he deliberately hurt himself, and he was in the sick call clinic every three days. Fortunately, the staff knew about what was happening. Every time his name showed up on a sick call, the ship always had to send a list before it could send the people. I was assigned to help out at a different clinic, or in supply of something. I felt like I would never get away from this horror. And finally, November 17th, 1993, a Friday came around. Now, I was shipping out to the States to process out. I figure I would never have to deal with Jim again. While packing, I found Jim's military ID and social security cards under my bed, but I merely tucked them in my purse, figuring he'd replace them by then. I was not going to be hunted down to return them, and I never thought to simply hand them into security. I left to go to the bus terminal. Waiting for the bus to take me to the airport, I sat reading a book. Suddenly, 
someone dropped something in my lap. I didn't look up right away, instead picking up the object and looking it over. My blood ran cold. It was my father's business card. Hesitantly, I flipped it over, and on the back were written instructions on how to get to my parents' house from the airport. I looked up, but saw no one near me and no sign of Jim. I knew it had been Jim. This was the card I gave him when I told him I wanted to get married at home. It hit me. Jim had walked right over to me, and no one had stopped him. Despite still being in Japan, no one in that terminal had known about the restraining order. He could have done anything. The bus was called, and I practically ran to climb aboard. I shook so hard I had trouble with my bags, sitting in the back seat, shaking. I looked out the window just as the bus began to move, and there, leaning on a tree next to my window, arms crossed and grinning, was Jim. I began crying, but kept watching until he was out of sight, not wanting to take my eyes off him just in case. Arriving in Treasure Island, California, an island close to Alcatraz, I felt such freedom. I wasn't put on a duty until Tuesday, since I had arrived on a weekend, and Monday was taken with processing medical and payroll and other paperwork. I had also been told that I wouldn't be able to go home until next week, as Thursday was Thanksgiving and no one was processed out before a holiday. So Tuesday, I called my mum to let her know I wouldn't be making it for Thanksgiving. The phone stood at the front door to the security building, so anyone walking up would need to pass the phone in order to report to the master at arms at the desk. As I talked to my mum, I got an odd feeling, one I still cannot describe. I turned around and there he was, he walked up to me and passed by me within a hand's breadth, the biggest shit-eating grin on his face. He turned and walked back downstairs and disappeared into the crowd of workers doing groundskeeping and stuff. I screamed and began to cry and shake and babble incoherently. Mum on the other side of the line asked what happened and I told her something like, Jim's here, I gotta go. I dropped the phone and ran to the security desk. I pulled out the ID cards and slapped them on the desk. I know you aren't supposed to tell me who checks in, but I gotta know. Did James, Vernon, Dickey just check in today? You see, I had a restraining order on him in Japan, and now we're in California, and I don't think it works anymore. The MMA, a tall, well-built man, went pale. He took the cards and checked the roster and slowly said, Yes, he did. Let me talk to my supervisor. Then the man took off, running, leaving the security desk and the building unguarded. It felt like hours, but could only have been seconds. When he returned and gave me a pass to talk to my temporary supervisor upstairs, I don't know if he still had those cards, and I didn't care. I took the pass and went up. My supervisor listened to the entire story, then left. He was gone for an over an hour, but it felt like longer. But it certainly was an hour. When he returned, he looked serious. He ordered me into his private office and to sit down. I sat and waited. He then told me that he'd checked out my story and spoken to Jim and his temporary supervisor. Jim was in a different section from me. I can't recall if my supervisor said two or six, and would have no reason to come near me. He then went on to explain that Jim's section was for the really bad guys, the ones being processed out for being dangerous and such. He told me that I was not the only person Jim had done this to, but I was the only one who had carried through and gotten a restraining order. That restraining order had allowed the military to process Jim out as a bad boy. The supervisor went on to explain that my lieutenant back in Japan had first reported him, the nurse that told me I was overreacting. 
Then the ambulance crew, the security crew and the hospital had also reported things. He said that the reason the dogs had been sent to look for Jim that day, when he'd slit his hand, was that he was considered highly dangerous and security had not been exaggerating. Finally, my supervisor said that when he spoke to Jim and Jim's supervisor, he told Jim in no uncertain tones that if Jim so much as blinked at me, he wouldn't know what hit him. My supervisor went on to soundly threaten Jim in the most polite, legal way he could. He asked if my paperwork was in process, and said I'd be excused from all duties until they were finished. I confirmed that I was only waiting for payroll to finish. Everything else had been done on Monday. He told me that he tried to get me out by Friday, but that Thanksgiving, being a Thursday, would hold me back a couple of days. I understood and told him so. He gave me a special pass to let me eat with the officers, so I wouldn't run into Jim at the gallery. Finally, I left, and went back to the all-female barracks. Wednesday morning at muster, I was surprised when my name was called with two men who had been there over a week. I was handed plane tickets, and told that I would be leaving that night. I made it back home to Vermont at nine in the morning, on Thanksgiving. Twenty-seven years have passed, and I still freak out when I hear someone knock. As an afternote, a few months after getting home, I was going through Mum's storage boxes of books, inherited from numerous relatives over the years, and I stumbled upon the book written by Jim's grandfather, James Dickey. It was called Deliverance. My mum says, if she had known, she would have warned me to avoid him like the plague. I hope I would have listened. Heroes don't make history. It is history that makes heroes. Jedo Suikin III. First, a little background. This began when I was 19, and continued for several years after that. I'm male, which I suppose matters to the story. When I was in high school, and my first year of college, I worked at a local grocery store part-time. I did everything, bagging groceries, stocking shelves, cashiering, working at the service desk. Towards the end of my time there, I was doing more stuff in the front of the store, mainly at the service desk, since I'd been there forever or cashiering. Anyway, it was just a small little grocery store, so we'd have regulars. Many of the same customers would come in a lot, and we'd talk to them and get to know them. I was also very young and naive at the time, and thus overly trusting. That would prove to be a detriment. There was this one guy who would come in about once a week, sometimes twice, and I'd been his cashier a few times. Eventually, he started standing in my line, even if other lines were shorter, which wasn't so unusual. I hated working in retail, but I was damn good with customers and was well liked. The only odd thing was that generally, the people who would do this were older, 60s or 70s at least, and were usually ladies. Whereas this guy had to be at most in his mid-40s. But whatever, I didn't think much of it. His name was Jeff. I didn't know his name for a long time, because he always paid with cash. But when I finally learned what it was, it was in one of the worst ways you can think of. We'll get to that. At first, though, Jeff seemed harmless. He would chat me up, and if I didn't have a line, we'd sometimes talk for a bit. He seemed interested in me and my life. But again, this wasn't so unusual apart from his age. But I just went with it. Jeff would ask me things about myself, like innocent questions. Or so I thought. He'd asked me what college I went to. And I told him, because I had no reason not to. At one point, he brought up cars, 
and he asked which one was mine. The parking lot was clearly visible through the large window at the front of the store, and I stupidly pointed at my car and said, It's that one. We lived in a small area, and a lot of the times by talking with customers, we'd realise we lived near each other or something, so I didn't think much of it when he asked me where I lived. I told him the name of the town, which was just adjacent to the city the store was in. And then, when he asked where in that town, I told him my street, and then described my house like a total idiot. I like to think I'm a smart guy in most situations, but that was not the case in this one. I didn't realise it at the time, but Jeff was systematically gathering information about me. But by the time I realised what was happening, it was too late. I had told him everything, short of giving him my cell phone number or actual address. One day I was working in the service desk, when Jeff came in, and he wanted me to ring up his groceries. However, I was busy selling lottery, or a money order to a customer or something like that and I told him I couldn't. He got this look on his face, like he didn't like the fact that I had told him no, but it was just for a second, and then he was smiley again. I didn't really talk to him much, because, you know, I was with a customer, and Jeff just stood there staring at me. I didn't really notice at first, because whatever machine I was using was giving me hell. Eventually, the customer was like, that guy keeps staring at you. And that's when I looked over at him. He wasn't smiling, but looked kind of angry instead. But the moment that I looked at him, the smile returned to his face. Then Jeff said something about me wearing a skirt. Now this wasn't the kind of humour he had exhibited before, and it was totally out of nowhere. So it gave me pause. I just kind of looked at him as he went on about how I'd look nice in a skirt or dress, just staring at him with a total WTF expression on my face. And the more he talked about it, the more unnerved I became. Another co-worker, Miranda, was in the service centre with me, and she and the customer as well as another nearby cashier were giving him the, what I presume was the same identical what-the-hell-is-happening expressions. He wasn't stopping, so I realised I had to say something to make him stop, and I couldn't even pretend to be humoured by it when I told him. I don't know what you're talking about, you'll never see me in anything but this uniform. My tone was serious, and he knew that I wasn't amused. This smile was gone, and I saw something on his face that I had never seen before. It was anger but it was also humiliation, and he did not like it one bit. He glared at me with a look that I felt in my bones, that rushed through me like a cold chill. My breath caught in my throat as we just stared at each other. I don't even know how to explain it, other than to say that this was the most menacing way anyone has ever looked at me. With that look, he was saying, you'll be sorry. I'm sure of it. Maybe I wasn't at the time, but in hindsight, without another word, he turned and walked away. After that, whenever Jeff would come into the store, he never stood in my line, which was fine with me. However, he would always loudly talk about me from the other registers and glare at me. He would badmouth me, but not in such a way that's overt, where we could really do much about it. Sometimes he wouldn't even refer to me by name, but we all knew he was talking about me. Sometimes at night, I would be the only cashier at the front as we approached closing time. Another would be in the office counting the drawers for the day, while the manager and other workers were usually in the back, or throughout the store, stocking shelves or cleaning. In the evenings, when I was more or less alone, I would notice the same car pull into the parking lot. 
but the driver never came in. The main defining feature of this car was the fact that one of the headlights was burnt out because of the previously mentioned large windows. Anyone in the parking lot could look into the store right at me. It took me a lot longer than I'm proud of to realise what was happening here, and the only way I realised who was in the car was by chance. My car was in the shop, and so my mum picked me up from work when I was done, and as I was waiting for her to get there outside of the front of the building, I was able to see the car away from the bright lights of the store. Sure enough, it was Jeff. My shock was palpable, and this was when I truly realised that something was very, very not right about all of this. I actually backed away in fear, and kept imagining what I would do if he got out of the car. The door inside had locked behind me, and while there were people in the store, they weren't in the front. But luckily, that was when my mum got there. I didn't tell her because my story would only worry her. Everyone at this store knew about Jeff before long, and it got so bad when he would come inside, everyone would instantly tell me to go back, and they would page me overhead when he left. Everyone, even managers. We all knew, and we were all creeped out. A lot of the time he would come in, and he didn't see me he would immediately leave again, or so I was told. I remember once we didn't notice him walking in, and by the time we realised he was almost at the doors, another cashier, Laura, saw him and looked scared. Now Laura wasn't easily rattled, but this guy had us all on edge, mostly because they were afraid of his weird fascination with me. She urged me frantically to hurry and get to the back, I hadn't noticed him yet, and was so confused. I just started to ask her why, but before I could finish, she said, Just go. I clearly remember at this moment, these few seconds between the time she said that, and the time I saw him walking through the doors when I realised what was happening. Jess saw me before I rushed to the back, and I was so unnerved that I locked the back door of the loading dock worried he'd come looking for me back there. When he was gone, Laura called me back up, and she couldn't even say anything. She told me that he gave her a furious look, and then stormed out of the store, and I remember being worried he would retaliate against her. Luckily, he never did. Things got worse. I began seeing Jeff around town, Like when I would go to the movies, to various stores, gas stations, the mall, or even the bank. Just a couple of these times might have been a coincidence, but this was happening a lot. Plus, it was Jeff, so I knew it was much more than that. But I had no proof that he was stalking me at this point, and didn't tell my parents. At the time while I was in college, I lived at home and commuted to school and I would often be there until dark, as by this point it was winter and got dark early. There were times when I would pull out of the school parking lot, and very shortly after that, I'd see a car behind me with just one headlight. Once or twice. Again, it could be a weird coincidence, but this was happening probably once a week. I still didn't tell my parents, though, even though I was pretty sure it was him. Then one night, while I was walking out of school into the, naturally, dark and deserted parking lot, I saw a car parked in an empty part of it with the lights off. I didn't think anything until the lights came on, and there was only one headlight. I knew it was him, and I sprinted to my car, threw my stuff in, and got the hell out of there. After that... I started walking out with either security guards or friends when I could, and a couple of times, I thought I saw his car, but he never put his lights on unless I was alone. He would never approach me or drive towards me during those times. 
It was like he was taunting me. It was like he wanted me to know that he was there and that he knew how to find me. This continued even after I quit working at the store. I became a tutor at a school instead, but his stalking didn't cease. Once I was at a friend's house after dark, and then I drove home. But I was almost there, when I realised I had forgotten something. Instead of pulling around in the driveway, I was going to loop around the street because it was easier. So I drove past my house. This particular night, I was home alone. Both my siblings lived elsewhere, and my parents were out, so the house was dark. There shouldn't have been anyone in the driveway, because I had just spoken to my parents, and they were nowhere near home. But when I drove by, I saw the dark shape of a car and taillights. Sometimes people turned around in our driveway because it was big, so I thought maybe it was just that. Or maybe someone had car trouble. But then the car pulled out the driveway after me. I looked in my rearview mirror and saw it. The car only had one headlight. This guy was at my house, and he had been waiting for me. He followed me for a while, and I couldn't go home, and I also didn't want to lead him to any of my friends. So I drove back to the store I used to work at, rushed inside, and looked out the windows to see if he'd followed me. Miranda was working that night, and asked me what was going on and I couldn't even speak. All I could do was look at her, and she knew. Her eyes got wide, and she couldn't speak either. After that, Jeff began following me more. He'd be at my school more often, and it was like he knew my schedule. He knew where I'd be, and when I'd be there. I saw him so often, and I shudder thinking about the times I didn't see him, but when he had to be there somewhere. And it wasn't just my schedule he learned. He knew my parents too to an extent, at least when I would be home alone. A few times I hear a car pull into the driveway at night, and I knew it was him before I even looked. But he never got out of his car, and would only stay for about ten minutes or so. Mainly this would be on Wednesday or Sunday nights, when my parents would be at church, and I began avoiding the house at these times either staying at school to study, or hanging out with friends, or going to the movies or something like that. At the time, I would occasionally babysit for someone at my parents' church, but during this time, I eventually stopped, afraid that he would follow me there. I decided I needed to look into this guy. Now at the time, I didn't even know this guy's name, but something told me to look on the sex offenders database. So one day, while at my friend Jill's house, I did just that. We looked at various pictures of nearby sex offenders, and discovered a shocking amount in the vicinity. And eventually, one of the small thumbnail pictures caught my eye. It was hard to tell if it was him, so I clicked on it to bring it up as a larger picture, and more information about this guy came up. Jill's internet was crap, so the page loaded slowly. His name came up first. It was Jeff. Jill and I waited for the picture to load, and it slowly came into view. I literally stopped breathing for a second, because it was him. That's how I learnt his name, and that's how I learnt that this man that was stalking me was a sexual predator. I didn't know what to do with this information. Thus far he hadn't done anything illegal per se, but I knew I needed to tell my parents, so I told them everything, and they were shocked to say the least. They had no idea. Jeff was good at hiding his activities, which makes me think he wasn't just not very stealthy with me, that I didn't catch him so often because he sucked at being subtle. No, Jeff wanted me to know that I was being watched, that I was the object of his obsession, so I told them everything. My dad was angry. Like I swear, if he knew where Jeff was, he would have gone to threatening him to leave me alone or something like that. My mum was just scared, 
really scared. She even cried for a little and talked about calling the police. But again, Jeff hadn't actually broken the law, other than maybe trespassing on our property. But I couldn't prove that it was him. All we could do was to be vigilant. I thought it would be better when they knew, but I felt worse. However, they needed to know. Everyone in my life needed to know. So they did. We started taking precautions. By this point, I was in my twenties, but I felt like a child. I didn't have a curfew per se, but my parents were hesitant to leave me alone even during the day. My dad is normally not easily rattled, which is why it was so unnerving to see him shaken up by this. We started keeping the cats inside, and when the dogs were out, we wouldn't let them out of sight. More than a few times, I remember sitting out on the back steps after letting them out to keep an eye on them, and just feeling like I was being watched. By this point, I never felt comfortable, never felt safe, so it might have just been paranoia, but I don't know. My mum also got me pepper spray, and I would carry it with me at all times when I was out of the house, and at night, I would take a knife to bed. Jeff didn't stop. I remember one time I was at a friend's apartment, and while she was in the bathroom, her front door started rattling like someone was trying to open it. Luckily, it was locked, and before she even got out of the bathroom, it had stopped. I didn't tell her at first because she wouldn't be spending the night there, so she wouldn't be alone. After that, I stopped going to friends' houses. I stopped going anywhere if I could help it, especially alone. This went on for years. I was out of college and it was still happening, for at least five years, this went on. When I moved into my first place on my own, I was scared. But I'd been seeing him less and less. And I didn't want to live with my parents forever. Things went fine, mostly. And there would be weeks and then months in between Jeff's sightings. Then one day, I saw him at the store. And I left right away. Not wanting him to see me. I didn't think he did and made a few steps before heading home. And that's when I realized I shouldn't let myself get complacent about this situation. I always, always made sure my doors and windows were locked when I wasn't home. And even when I was sometimes, especially at night, or if I had a bad feeling. I've been doing this since before the Jeff situation began. So that's how I knew there was no way that I'd left my front door not only unlocked, but slightly open. This wasn't right. I should have called the police, but I was feeling brazen. I think I was so tired of feeling like I wasn't in control, that I was trying to take the situation back into my own hands. So I readied my pepper spray and headed inside. And then I went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife. I went around my place and checked every closet checked under every bed, and checked everywhere that someone could be hiding. But no one was there. That was a truly terrifying experience. I kept expecting him to pop up out of some hiding place, but he didn't. Jeff wasn't there. I still couldn't sleep that night, and I didn't want anyone to know. So I got a hotel room. For a long time, I never told anyone about this incident, because this was a clear line that Jeff had crossed. I have no proof it was him, but I know it was. I never called the police, though, because nothing was amiss, and there were no signs that anyone had broken in at all. But I knew he'd been there. I felt him. It scares me to wonder what would have happened if I'd have been home when he got there. Unless you've been through something like this, you can't know what it's like to go through this sort of experience. How it wrecks havoc on your psyche. How it shatters your trust and sense of safety. These are things you don't really notice until they're ripped away from you. There's this feeling of security that I've lost, and I don't think I'll ever get it back. It's been years since I've seen or heard from Jeff, though I still live in the area. I have no idea if he's still watching me. Most of the time I think he's moved on, or has been jailed or something. 
But every once in a while I'll be in a parking lot or home alone and just get that feeling, that one that I've come to associate with him. Maybe it's just the paranoia, a gift that Jeff gave me the day he talked to me about wearing a dress. I hope that's all it is, but sometimes I wonder. It's just a part of my life now. I don't talk about it very much, but everyone in my life knows about it. It's like the elephant in the room. I've changed a lot since then. I've got anxiety issues and I'm extremely private. I'm not sure if it's all because of this, but it's at least a factor. I'm still cautious. I still don't like to go out alone after dark. I still lock my doors and windows whether it's nighttime or not. I lock the bathroom door every time I shower. I check the locks at least three times before going to sleep. And I still feel nervous. If anything seems out of place in my apartment, or if I can't find something that should be in a particular place but isn't. I still carry pepper spray with me even during the day. And I still take a knife to bed. About 1996, I was driving home and coming down the freeway. In my particular area, the two most heavily used exits are about two miles apart, with a semi slash used rest stop in between at about the halfway point. It was sometime in the early evening, and there were almost no other cars in my vicinity. I'm cruising at 70, and get over into the right lane due to my exit readily approaching. As I start to coast to drop speed, I clearly hear someone whisper, Faster! in my ear. The Tatch goes nuts, and the speedometer starts quickly accelerating past 80. I freak out. I've got less than a quarter of a mile and my brakes aren't doing anything. It's like I'm not even pushing the thing to the floor. And then it stopped. I got off at my exit, pulled into a gas station and jumped out my car. Never had a mechanical problem with a car, wasn't drunk and wasn't high. Hell, the radio wasn't even on. Plain as day, I heard a little boy's voice whisper in my ear, and I'll never forget it, and it makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand. This second story wasn't necessarily about me, but I was present. I'm roughly 14 or so. My sister is about four or five, and we're in the kitchen with my mum. She's doing dishes. My sister's at the table colouring, and I'm sitting by the table. My sister pauses, contorts her face and says, I'll get it, mother. She then proceeds to make eye contact from the back of my mum's head, slowly to the phone on the counter. And then it rang. In later years discussing it, we both recounted that my sister said that line. Weird. Like she never called mum mother. It was just creepy. This happened to my friend Josh, about four years ago. Josh was working at our local movie theatre in a crummy little town. It was about 2am, and he was cleaning up all the popcorn debris that was left behind from a midnight viewing. He's just texting me lazily, as I was playing World of Warcraft at the time, and was using his company to stay awake. And then I get a message that says something happened and I didn't hear from him for about 40 minutes. When he gets back to me, he says that he was just clearing up some popcorn that someone spilled and picking up someone's little cup when he heard a little giggle behind him. It sounded like a young child, definitely female. He turned around, creeped out as he knew there was no one there, and no one was there. The sound was now coming from the hallway, so down the stairs he plopped and peeked around the corner. No one was there. At that moment, he decided he'd had enough, went to speak with a co-worker, and cooled off for about 20 minutes before venturing back in. He didn't hear that girl again, but when he spoke with a manager the next day, 
it was common knowledge in that theatre that it is haunted by the ghost of a little girl, as allegedly the site the movie theatre stands on used to be an old schoolhouse, where apparently some girls died. I met my stalker when I was in middle school. My school consisted of 7th grade through 12th grade and had a normal program and an accelerated program, with the students in each program being pretty segregated. My friends and I belonged to the accelerated program, but there was one guy in the group from the normal program, Carson. All in all, we were typical teenagers, with Carson being the group's prankster. We only could hang out at school, because we were all shipped in from various parts of the country for the accelerated program. So after school, we would all get on AOL to chat and play games. Online, we had even more friends, and we'd invite our own local friends to chat with us also. One day, Carlson invited in his friend Steve to join the chat. He was nice and contributed a lot to our conversations. We learned Steve actually attended our school, but he was in the normal program and had a different lunch period than the rest of us, so we had almost no chance of crossing paths. We insisted on meeting him, however, and scheduled for Steve to come to my locker before first period. The next morning, we waited, and Steve never came. My friend and I did have a short exchange with another kid, Marco, which consisted of us telling him to go away. Marco had been Carson's satellite since the beginning of the year. Wherever Carson went... Marco would stand 10 to 15 feet away, just watching us. We had tried being friends with him, but he was simply too strange for us. He would touch your face unexpectedly, or try and sneak up behind you and bite you, or tell you he wanted to see you inside out. His list of strange behaviours was a mile long. A few days after Steve failed to come and meet us, it came to light that Steve was really Marco, and that the whole thing was one of Carson's pranks. Considering Marco had been a pleasant addition to the chat as Steve, we gave him another chance to join the real group. Besides Carson, I was the only person that really gave Marco a chance. He still did the weird things he had always been doing, but it was now apparent that it was all an act to get attention for being the weird guy. Marco was being abused at home by his mum's boyfriend. He rarely saw his mum because she worked too much. Marco was the poster child for bad attention is still attention. Still, my friends wanted him out of the group, and I repeatedly found myself arguing his case to let him stay. Once, I caught an older student, a boy that lived on my street, beating Marco up. Being much larger than either of us, he was literally picking Marco up and slamming him into the lockers while he called him a freak. Knowing the bully and his mother, I did what was my signature move at the time and kicked him in the balls, while threatening to tattle to his parents about how he was treating my friends. I believe this was the catalyst for years of torment, as Marco became my satellite. After that day. At school, Marco followed me any chance he got. At home, he'd message me non-stop, typically in private chat, as my other friends wanted nothing to do with him. I felt bad, because he was a sweet kid besides these attention-seeking stunts, and no one should have to go through a life with no friends. Eventually, Marco asked me out, to which I politely declined. He was my friend, but he was not the type of guy I would ever be interested in dating. He was persistent, begging me to give him a chance, over and over again, and I would tell him no. 
One day his approach changed. You will go out with me, or I'll show your mum all our chat logs. There was nothing especially bad in the logs. I wasn't drinking or doing drugs or anything bad, but I was pretty depressed at the time, and sometimes talked about wanting to kill myself. If my parents saw that, I could effectively kiss my freedom and privacy goodbye. I bluffed him, telling him good luck with any attempts to convince my parents to believe him over me, which seemed to work. I wasn't very impressed with the stunt, and stopped talking to him. A few weeks went by, and Marco came crawling back, begging for forgiveness. I eventually caved, allowing him back into the group. At first, he was well behaved again, but slowly, he started pestering me to be his girlfriend. Over the course of high school, he tried many different methods. Begging, blackmailing, attacking my self-esteem, catfishing, threatening any guys I dated, threatening suicide, and more. I tried to be nice at first, but eventually had to get pretty mean in how I said no. His behaviour would always reach a boiling point that forced me to cut him out of our friendship group. It was nearly impossible to actually get rid of him, however. Online, he would create dozens of new accounts to send messages from, overwhelming my attempts to block him. He would call my phone all night long, and would leave woeful messages about how lonely he was, and how he would kill himself if I stopped being his friend. He would show up at my house and stand outside my bedroom window randomly. When my parents had parties, like the 4th of July, Thanksgiving and Halloween, he always managed a way to show up. Their parties were always quite big, with an open door policy. So he'd slip in, typically in disguise, and then he'd ultimately do something to get himself thrown out. Like get belligerently drunk, or stuff his face with finger foods, and then put them back on the serving platters. The first time I really felt that Marco might actually be a threat was at one of my parents' Halloween parties when we were 16. One of my dad's friends had a son our age, Tim, that was a bit of a jerk. He fancied himself pretty cool, and thought it would be fun to pick a fight with the weird kid to make a display of his own superior strength. Marco accepted his challenge. We all knew he was about to get the crap beaten out of him. Going onto the streets, Tim towered over Marco. That year, Marco was dressed as Alex from A Clockwork Orange, his favourite book, with his costume including a cane. He swung the cane at Tim, hitting Tim in the head with it. Tim went down quickly, and Marco beat him until an adult intervened and sent him home. Marco's go-to threat whenever I had a boyfriend was, I'll beat him to death with a shovel, and then use it to bury his body. Suddenly, this threat seemed like something he'd be capable of. Our senior year of high school, Marco's dad died in prison. He learned the real reason his dad was in prison was for murdering someone. He always thought his dad was in for drugs, and Marco started to spiral out of control. He says his dad was a murderer, so he too must be doomed to be one also. He dropped out of school halfway through the year. My brother said after I'd left home for college, Marco came to the house looking for me a few times. Once he figured out I wasn't there, he'd just come and stand in the front yard aimlessly, playing with a Bic lighter until someone threatened to call the police. One of my biggest worries was that he'd try to set their house on fire in some weird way to punish me. When I'd go home with my boyfriend, he'd always show up at my parents' house. At one point, he'd tried to intimidate my boyfriend into breaking up with me by showing me he had a hunting knife. It was always a big ordeal getting him to leave. A lot of the issues have now eased up, just due to the distance and time. I don't use social media much anymore, and I'm able to semi-block people on my phone. It's a bit weird. I can see when a block number tries to call me, but it doesn't ring. 
and I'm able to receive voicemails and text messages from blocked numbers, but not pictures. Initially, he was calling and texting every day. Hundreds of messages. I tried asking him to stop, but this will only encourage him. My family no longer lives in that area, so I'm significantly less worried for their safety. I found the most successful way of dealing with Marco is simply ignoring him. Eventually, his messages dwindled down to once a week, then once a month. Now maybe I hear from him officially once a year. His messages are typically something along the lines of, please just be my friend. I won't try for anything anymore. I just need you in my life. The last time I actually spoke to him, which was about four to five years ago now, Marco tried to tell me I'd ruined his life. He said that I'd put some spell on him, that he couldn't move forward. He told me he would kill himself, and it would be my fault. I finally had to tell him that I didn't care if he killed himself. In fact, it would be a relief. His most recent MO is to call my work phone from a private number, just to hear me answer the phone and then hang up. He also calls and texts my brother, our high school friends, my brother's best friend, my parents, my grandparents, my aunt and her husband, to beg them to ask me to call him. Marco messaged my husband, Tell her she's my angel, the love of my life. I'm nothing without her. I worry he'll snap someday, show up at my house or job, and try to end me. I have security systems and other means of protection, but I still get paranoid about it. I've spoken to the police about getting a restraining order, but they've told me there's no real grounds unless he does start showing up and threatening me. So I guess... We'll have to see what happens. It also turns out that Facebook puts all the blocked messages in a folder, and I stumbled across them a few months ago. There were about 20 messages from strangers, all thankfully a few years old, letting me know they had met Marco on chat roulette, and he had shared my personal information with them. Your ex-boyfriend asked me to let me know he loves you, and he's sorry. You should really consider reaching out to him. A few of the messages were warnings, letting me know how crazy he sounded, and that maybe I should consider contacting the police. It's findings like this that makes me still scared, even though I'm thankful I haven't heard from him directly in quite some time. This is a story of mine that I can't remember properly, because I was less than a year old. But my mum and dad have both told it to me many times, and it is still entertaining and scary. Background knowledge to know before this story, just so you know how my house was set up. When I was younger, I used to live in a two-floor house in Illinois. The house was a simple design, a small living room, kitchen and dining room on the bottom floor. And on the second floor, there was a washing machine, a dryer, a bathroom, and two bedrooms. With me being as young as I was, my parents had baby gates at the top and bottom of the stairs. I was still sitting in a high chair at this age. Now the story begins. We were all eating dinner downstairs. The baby gates were all up, and I was secure in my high chair. My dad was watching the news, and my mum was feeding me. My dad had my mum look at the TV for the report for less than a minute. They were distracted from me, and couldn't see me. Out of nowhere, they heard the dryer start upstairs. It was only the three of us living there, and only the three of us were home. My mum and dad looked at my high chair. I wasn't there. They ended up being quite confused as to what was going on, and my mum decided to go upstairs and turn the dryer off. Well, she decided to open it for some odd reason, and I was in the dryer. Now if you know anything about dryers, you know that you have to push a button for it to start, 
and it's quite difficult to close the door by yourself. I was in the dryer, with the door closed, and it was going, which is almost impossible with only one person. Also, I know it seems weird, but I was about seven months old. But I remember a few things from that day which my parents didn't know. At that age, and at that place, I would always play with an adult who wasn't real. He had been dead for years, and that's what he used to tell me. My parents say that when I was staring off at nothing, there was a dark shadow there, and I would talk in some odd language. And it wasn't like how babies talk, it was different. The day that the incident happened, I remember him taking me upstairs, but I don't remember anything after that. It was rather creepy, and wasn't very normal. I guess I should explain to you a few features of him. He had mostly grey eyes. He had a full head of jet black hair. There were times when he had a weapon of some kind. But those times were only when my parents fought. He had kind of treated me as if I were his own. Looking back on it now, I guess he was just trying to bring me closer to him, so that I could be his own. But my mum was smarter, and felt as if something was off in the house. But I swear I still see him to this day. Even though we've moved to a different house in a different city, and a different state. I have another story that's a bit more recent. It was my 14th birthday, and I had friends to sleep over. My mum had decided to leave six teenagers alone in the bad part of town while she went to the casino. We ended up leaving my room and went down the hallway to the living room. We'd heard a door shut outside. We all thought my mum came home early, but when they had me look outside, I saw a dark figure. It looked human, but at the same time it didn't. I told my friends and none of them believed me. So I had one of my friends get up and look outside as well. She screamed and told the others that I wasn't messing about and that it was the truth. Then all but two of them started screaming at once. I told them to be quiet and to stay away from the windows. Mind you, in my neighborhood, it is believed to be a skinwalker lady that lives very nearby. That's what I started to think fit the description of it. They kept freaking out, and then by the time my mum got home, we all screamed. She doesn't know what happened the night of my party, and I hope she doesn't find out any time soon. When I split up with my ex of two years, I decided that because we were friends before, we'd remain friends after. Big mistake. He changed my email recoveries to his email, so I couldn't change my password. He looked at my Google Chrome passwords and wrote them all down. Regularly checked my emails, Facebook, messages and everything. After we split up, he was physically violent. So I told my mum to ban him from the house. He was still doing bits for her while I was at work, visiting often because we were friendly. When he asked me when he'd be able to see me again, I always told him soon and put him off because of the nature of our breakup. The violence scared me to my core. I was a changed person. I felt trapped. Then he didn't make it any worse when he climbed over my back garden fence and knocked on my window and demanded to be let in. It got to the point that even after a few months after we'd split up, and after I'd not seen him in roughly three months, I'd arrange a date with a guy. The date was awful, but that's another story. My ex left multiple messages on my phone, and after the date had finished, he asked me where I was. I answered that I was in town, and he had apparently read my messages to this guy on the dating site I used, got his number, and called him multiple times after. He also messaged my mother, telling her that I was on a date with a stranger. I also remember he turned up at the train station, saw me meeting this guy, and then he left. He wanted to surprise me, apparently. When we were together, he also found out some things about my past, 
and when an old flame messaged me on Facebook, he and I got into an argument. He was staying over at the time, and stormed out of the room to shout in my mother's face that I was a filthy cheater. I'm so glad that's over now. I'm a 17-year-old male, working a minimum wage job at a movie theatre. It's a small family-owned establishment in Jersey. Nothing like Regal Cinemas or AMC. It's just an okay neighbourhood, but a lot seems to happen in the area of the township. So this happened on my very first day working there. I'm behind the register, learning how to ring up customers' food. My trainer leaves me to help a few customers, sensing I've got it down. Bad idea. A gentleman walks in, balding, and with what appears to be snot dripping from his nose. A lot of it. Greenish. Shiny. And in his hand he had one of those probiotic milkshakes. He walks right up to me, completely ignoring the customer I'm with. Hey. Hey. Look at me. I look around, and he's clearly speaking to me. And that's definitely not my name. I hope you're my moment, sir, I tell him. Clearly, he doesn't like my answer. I'm off my meds now. I ain't crazy, man. The guy gets more agitated, scowling at me. And I'm getting more and more uneasy. And none of my co-workers are in sight. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know you. If you keep calling me crazy, man, he interrupts. I'll take you behind the dumpster and break off your legs and your jaw and dump your ass in there. I know when you get off. Now, I'm clearly shaken, and the customer left, also disturbed. Thanks, man. But before I can even think of what to say or do, the guy walks off and starts smacking an arcade machine we have, trying to talk to a father and a child across the room. I hear him say something about meds, right as my trainer walks back in. I tell her the story, and she asks the man to leave. He seems hesitant, but he does as she asks. Needless to say, I didn't walk alone to my car after that shift. A friend of mine's house burnt to the ground when I was younger, and his family moved across the street in a house that they rented for a bit. The basement in said rented house was unfinished, so being middle schoolers, we decided we would use the basement to ride skateboards and scooters. So after one night of skateboarding, we head upstairs to watch scary movies and pass out. Neither of his parents nor his sister were home, as they went to his grandparents for the night if I remember correctly. As we were getting close to sleep, we heard something hit the ground really hard on the concrete of the basement. So being dumb teenagers, we decided to investigate. As we opened the door to the basement to peer down, we just see a skateboard floating mid-air. We sit and watch it for a few seconds, and then it drops suddenly and very violently. Needless to say, we packed stuff up and sprinted back to my house. Not much sleeping happened that night. His family moved out soon after, and we tended to avoid that place as much as possible after that. These are my older brother's experiences. He used to work at a movie theatre about two to three years ago, when he was about 23 or so. This theatre was large and stood out in our tiny Oregon coast town. My brother Alex was going to work there to get extra money, along with my mother's friend Jill, who was a manager at the time. He started out in janitorial work late at night, to the early hours of the morning. At first it was a pain to him. He hated getting up for the graveyard shifts, but the weird stuff that kept happening meant he would keep going back. One night he was on bathroom duty, just as Jill left to take another worker home, leaving him by himself. 
as he was cleaning a stall, he could hear someone's footsteps enter the bathroom, to slowly go into the stall next to him and lock the door. He quickly got up to check the stall next to him, which swung open easily with one yank, and no one was in the stall. Needless to say, he got out of the bathroom faster than a bat out of hell, and waited a good 30 minutes in the candies room to calm down. Even other workers had complained of weird things happening, such as people walking behind them, breathing on their necks, whispering, touching, and things moving in the projection room. Even workers before them reported the hydraulic doors slamming and lights flickering. Apparently, last janitors that worked there made the spirit angry enough that he would manifest in the storage rooms or in reflections, scaring them. To make the workplace a little less scary, Alex's friend Stacy decided to nickname the spirit Bob. Pretty nice name. Not even kidding. He shook the door at her when she named him. Now Bob was an interesting fellow. As the months and hauntings continued, my brother noticed a pattern with him. His favourite theatre rooms were three and six, where horror movies played. He realised they might be his favourites because he was able to feed off the fear the moviegoers would feel. This was one of the best theories he could come up with, which actually makes sense. Bob also had a sense of humour. Bad humour. In the theatre there was a place that the employees would call the Ghost Hall, which is a long concrete hallway used as an emergency exit. But other than that, never really had a purpose. On my brother's end shift, where he would have to lock up and set up the security system, Bob would leave the door at the end of the ghost hallway open, wait for my brother to notice on the security cameras, wait for him to go and try to close it, and then slam it, leaving him in the dark with at least 20 feet of darkness above and 10 feet of darkness around. He never successfully locked him out of the theatre, but started to take a liking to him. He was worried if it was demonic at one point, where he would request a light off at will and have it shut off. He quit his job a while ago, but that still doesn't stop him from seeing Bob moving around the projection window. Amazing and creepy. Me and my ex-boyfriend met in 2016. He was actually still going out with someone else at the time, although it was pretty obvious that he was into me. But I told him that we couldn't get together until his girlfriend was out of the picture. If he wanted to be more than friends, that is. He literally threw her things out of his house. She moved in there without his knowledge or approval, you see. But she kept on going back, saying that she would kill herself and so on if he ever left her. Him being extremely nice and naive, took her back again and again and again. Every time it was the same. She would call him every 10 minutes, knowing he was at work, calling him all kinds of horrible things. He had such low self-esteem because of her, and that was sad. He was struggling a lot, and I thought he'd never be able to get rid of her. So I told him we could not see each other anymore, even as friends. I knew that this would trigger him, and it did and he was finally able to leave her for good, and then we started dating. After a few weeks, his ex's mother called from another country, saying her daughter tried to kill herself because of him. She even left a note, and that she was in the hospital and needs to call her now, because at 9pm, she would be conscious. And that he needs to call her at 9pm, because then she'll be conscious. We checked the police reports from a few days prior, and guess what? No suicide attempts were made, so he didn't do anything. Three days later, her friends call him, saying she's on the hills in the house, and that she's gonna jump. He told them not to bother him, and the next day she started showing up at the place we work, as we both cook in a restaurant, and she stayed there all day, every day, all summer. We quit working there, so she started coming to our house, 
as we were living together at this point, and started breaking everything. When she saw this, and how it wasn't helping her situation, she started calling from hidden numbers. At the time, we just learned to stop answering. She then told us that her mother disowned her in an attempt to get back with him. This didn't work out either. Then she began coming over to our new place every day, and this went on for a year. At this point, we're expecting our first child, and honestly, I don't know what to expect from her. I laughed for the most part at this, but it really became ridiculous. There are some wonderful things about being poor, young, and in love. Sadly, this is about none of those things. When I was 22, I decided to move in with my equally poor boyfriend. Unfortunately, poor plus poor equals mostly poor, but not so destitute that we couldn't afford an apartment in a college town. We happily moved into our little one-bedroom, first floor apartment. Sure, it had its problems. The lead best paint was so thick that we were sure we would survive a nuclear attack. The bathroom didn't have a vent, and instead it had a window in the shower. The appliances were from the time of my grandmother, but it was home, our home, and we loved it. My boyfriend worked the graveyard shift, and I worked days, so we spent a lot of time apart. That meant that when we were together, we enjoyed the simple things in life. Over time, when I was waking up and taking my morning shower, my boyfriend, who was just getting home, realised that he could come up to our open shower window and sneak a peek. I always caught him. It was good fun, and we laughed. Eventually, I started to notice there was a log standing up right outside that window. I continually asked him why he would need that. He was already tall enough. He claimed it wasn't him, and would move it away when I went outside to show him. Yet, every few days, it would move right back. The guys who cared for the yard were there several times a week, so they must have just been moving it back out of the way against the building. Finally, before the snow fell, the yard workers cleared away all the yard debris, and we went on in peaceful oblivion, candy-coated, love-filled oblivion. Time went on, and our lease was up, but there was a great special at our cheap apartment complex. We could now rent two bedrooms even cheaper than one. We happily signed the new lease. The only real problem was that our one-bedroom apartment was on a nice suburban street facing houses, so we never really noticed how bad our neighbourhood was. We were moved to the other end of the community, behind an abandoned strip mall. Our front yard consisted of a dark alley and some dumpsters behind a recently vacated Chinese buffet, where a lot of stray cats seemed to live. None of this mattered in our dimly lit front yard, though. Our apartment was super cheap and super huge. What more could we ask for? That year, we were so happy that my boyfriend went to buy me a ring on Valentine's Day. Being young and giddy in love, he wasn't able to keep the secret, and I told him yes before he could even ask the question. He didn't have a lot of money, so he bought the ring with the help of a friend's father, who owned a jewellery store. He got it for a good price, but with the drop in price, so comes a drop in the attention to detail. I was devastated when he brought home the ring, along with our wedding band set to find out that someone had mistaken my very tiny four ring size with a twelve. My rings were made for monster hands. What a terrible way to start our engagement. Clearly they needed to go back, so we put them in his glove box, but then a snowstorm prevented him from taking them back that day. The next day he went to his car to find that it had been broken into. Nothing had been taken except the rings from the glove box. We never did have the money to replace them. 
We personally went to every pawn shop in the area, and everybody said that they hadn't seen anything. Winter passed and summer came. With the summer came the warm breezes and the fresh air through our open windows. What the summer did not bring was more money. Not for us and not for the city. We lost our phone service for non-payments, but it didn't matter. The only people we talked to were each other. Meanwhile, the city cut police and closed a few stations. Most of them in our neighbourhood. It didn't matter though. Summer days are long, and our dingy little corner of the community wasn't at all intimidating in the daylight. One night, my husband-to-be turned in for the night early. So I decided that after a long day, what I really needed was a nice soak in the bath. I walked into the bathroom and began to run the water, adding my bath salts and bubble bath. I opened the window for that nice summer breeze and took off my clothes and dumped them in a pile by the open bathroom door. I then grabbed my laptop to set on the closed toilet seat so that I could relax in the tub with a movie. This would be at least two hours of pure bliss. Nothing beats a long soak in my book. I turned the volume up on my laptop and relaxed the hours away with one movie after another. What must have been four hours later, I pulled the plug on the drain and sat while the water swirled away. I slowly stood up, stretched and dried off. The now cool night air hitting my face through the window. I figured I'd just leave that open though. The apartment could use the airing out. I stepped out of the tub and across the bathroom. I didn't bother to move my pile of clothes, instead stepping around them in a manner to get out of the partially opened bathroom door. This move put me looking back into the bathroom. Right out of my window, I saw a tall man. At first I was startled, but quickly realised it was just my fiancé playing a trick on me, like he used to do at our old apartment. Then I saw his eyes, up too high in the window, and everything in my head began to swim. I couldn't scream, I couldn't move, I could only stand there naked and stare. Then everything came into startling detail. He was standing up on something so high that I could see his full torso in the window. His full torso and his thing. There was a man outside my window, jerking off. The motion drew my attention to his hand, and everything happened in a split second after I saw him. While I was frozen to the spot, I noticed he was wearing a silver ring with a Celtic knot worn on it. I made a mental note of a ways to identify him as I finally unfroze and ran to the bedroom. There's a man outside the bedroom window. My fiancé couldn't understand me as I said it so fast. What? What? There's a man outside our window. He's beating off. He was watching me. Oh my God, make him go away. I was in hysterics as everything sunk in. That man could have been there hovering over me for hours. The only thing separating us was a thin screen. When I had stood up, his member was inches away from my face, a body towering over me. I just kept covering myself with blankets and telling my fiancé to make him go away. By the time my fiancé woke up and went to check the situation out, nobody was anywhere around. There was only a log standing upright like a step outside our bathroom window. In the aftermath, we filed a police report, but had no phones to call so had to drive a good 20 minutes away to do so. They didn't have enough forces to do anything about the situation anyway, and we didn't have enough money to break our lease. Instead, we spent the rest of the year living in fear. I covered every window with black contact paper, and I wedged boards into every window so they couldn't be opened. The bathroom window was never opened again. I never left without pepper spray. I never left after dark, 
Up for the rest of the year, most nights, I'd hear a faint noise outside our bathroom window, which was next to our bathroom. In the morning, when my fiancé would check it out, there would be imprints in the ground, as if someone had recently been standing there. I wish I could say this is just a story. I wish I could say that. But it is all the truth of three long years of my life, and I still can't sleep at night. I used to live alone in a small and old apartment when I was 18. I had a favourite spoon that I would keep using to eat. Weird, I know. But whenever I'm home alone, I can't bring myself to use another. So a few months after being in there, I started noticing that this said spoon kept going missing, and I would later find it in very weird locations. I'd throw it in the sink and find it behind the TV or in another room. I'd put it back in the drawer and leave only to find it later on my computer desk. I threw it back in the drawer and it stayed there for the night, but the next day it was in the bathroom sitting with my toothbrush. I never think much about it, and thought that I unknowingly forgot that I put it in weird places because I rarely get any sleep and have the intention span of a goldfish. A year passes, would these things keep on happening? And then the spoon disappears completely, and I never find it. Four months later, I move out because I landed a job in a different hospital which was a tad bit too far from where I lived. As I was unpacking, I find said spoon between my clothes in the bag. That's when I got really spooked. Now I've been living in the same apartment ever since then, and the spoon has stayed in its place and never disappeared afterwards. I'm not sure what to think of that, but it's kind of funny when I look back on it. In my previous journeys to Arizona, I explored all the natural wonders, like the Grand Canyon, Superstition Mountain, the Painted Desert. My grandfather had an obsession with the Old West, cowboys and spaghetti westerns. He was so determined to go to Tombstone to see the OK Coral. So we went to Tombstone. Mind you, I'm a guy who can be viewed as a sensitive. To describe the trip in words, it was a strange one. So we arrived at Tombstone at around 10 in the morning. We do our tourist things, old timey photos, try on weird hats, try their old beers, and look at the pictures. After a few hours, we decided to go to the old theatre. This place was not very big, two stories high. A lady is standing in front of it, saying that there are tours of the theatre starting at ten dollars a person. So we go in. This theatre is one of those that has a poker room on the bottom floor, top floor with blankets blocking off some small rooms for the prostitution and a stage. Me being me, I decided to go ahead of the tour. I went to see what's ahead by myself. I saw two steps that led up to a very small room with a piano to the left, a wall of photos to the right, and the thing that I didn't notice at the very center was an old hearst with a casket in it, with a portrait of someone who had been transported to their final resting place. I'm not moving, mind you. I'm standing as still as a telephone pole. The casket inside is closed. Every muscle wants to leave, but my mind wasn't working with my body. I see the casket lid lift up and then close. I was completely alone and don't remember leaving the room, but I did and then was back with the rest of the group. It was a freaky experience. I grew up near the old mission in South Texas. I remember me and my siblings were wandering around a particularly decrepit mansion. There were areas that had obviously been fixed up and made prettier for the tourists, but there were some areas that were sealed off. The closest sealed off areas were where we were wandering, and it was what appeared to be a monk's quarters. 
The door was bolted shut and locked. But right below the handle was a black spot, where some of the wood had been knocked away. It was a hot day, broad daylight the day we were there, Yet when you glanced at that hole, it was completely pitch black inside. I was curious to see more, so I stuck my face in the hole. There was an old metal cup, and the faint outlines of a small table and a chair that was knocked over on a dirt floor. Just as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, to see these things, something cold from the inside pushed my face away from the hole in the door. This happened when I was about 13 years old. I'm now 24, and still use this experience as a reminder to be aware of my surroundings, and it has really helped me out. Especially when I was 21, but I will talk about that later. My mother had decided to drag me along to Walmart because she wanted me to help her cut the shopping time in half. Normally, she would send me to different aisles so I could find stuff and bring it back to the cart, in order to save time. I had a phone at the time, and was texting some friends, so I wasn't really paying attention while following my mother around. I did happen to notice that she had suddenly stopped putting stuff in the cart, and kept going quickly to random aisles. The aisles she was picking had nothing to do with why we were there in the first place. Mum? What are you doing? Shh! She keeps scurrying along to different aisles. She will stop for a minute, look around wildly, and then go into another random aisle. I kept asking her what was going on, and she kept hushing me, and then finally told me that we were being followed. I looked around, and didn't see anyone. Mum? What are you talking about? You're paranoid. She hustles to the next aisle a moment after. She then goes between the aisles and stops short, me Lily bumping into her. I got annoyed at this point and was about to complain again, and then she tells me in a lone and serious tone, this guy's been following us since we got in from the parking lot. I thought he was weird, because he came down the first two aisles with us. I went to a different aisle, and he had no business to be in the baby aisle, like little boy's aisle. Then I went into the women's lingerie aisle, and he had been following us, staring. I didn't really know what to say, but then she butts in and quickly says, I stopped here for a reason. He'll be looking out for us. Look down that aisle, peek your head around the corner. He's going to come looking for us, and when you make eye contact with him, watch his reaction. I was a little creeped out, but looked down the empty aisle, and sure enough, this man in a brown jacket, dirty jeans, and a big 70s looking moustache comes peeking down the aisle all hurried, like he'd been fast walking. He and I make eye contact, and his eyes widen. I know my mother was behind me looking at him too. He saw both of us looking, and I guess his shocked expression was him realising he was busted, because he hauled ass and ran the other way. We left right after that, and went home. My mother always told me to pay attention to your surroundings, and her lessons are very likely what saved my life years later. This is the second story. So I stopped lift driving because of this kind of incident. It was nothing to do with Lyft, but because driving at night makes situations more likely to happen. But onto the story. I was Lyft driving about three years ago. I'm a female and was 21 at the time, and just looking to make extra cash for the bills. I heard from a co-worker it was a good idea, because she makes a ton of money doing it. I lived in Portsmouth, Virginia at the time, and wasn't even from Virginia. I had just moved there a couple of years ago, and didn't really know much about the real world yet, and how creepy people can be. I lived close to a gas station, and was going to fuel up a bit before driving people around for a few hours. I pulled up to the gas station at about nine at night, and parked next to a pump. I got out, 
and was on my way inside the gas station when I noticed something weird. There were a few people parked there already, but there was one car in particular that caught my eye. There were two people in this car, but one was in the driver's seat and the other was in the back seat. I found it odd because you would think the back seat passenger would be sitting in the front seat, but I dismissed the thought because there may be a third person inside the gas station. I went inside, paid for my gas, and then was walking out of the store when the dude in the back seat opens the door and starts walking towards me. What I noticed first was he was wearing some sort of colourful suit that you will typically see people wearing during Easter. It was baby blue, but the outer jacket was gone. He was wearing the pants and nice fancy shoes as well. But then I saw what instantly disgusted me. He was wearing a belt that was unbuckled and his fly was unzipped. His pants were completely undone. I tried to move past him, but he starts saying, Miss, Miss, loudly, and begins following me. He's got super close to me, and I whirled around to face him. He started smiling and asking me if I had COX internet, because him and his buddy were selling it. Number one, he wasn't wearing a uniform, and number two, his car didn't even have a company logo on it. Anyway, I tried keeping the distance between us. He starts telling me to hold on and to wait and then asks me if I have a boyfriend. I was 10 feet from him at this point, loudly saying, yes, I do have a boyfriend and went into my car. I didn't want to pump my gas. Something was weird about this. I quickly texted one of my girlfriends about it and something told me to look up. I noticed the dude get back into the back seat of his friend's car, and they drove slowly to the edge of the gas station like they were going to leave, only they were both looking at me. I locked my doors and put my key in the ignition. I was watching them, and then it happened. They slowly backed away from the exit and drove slowly next to me, and suddenly both of them jumped out their car and ran to my passenger side door. I floored it out the gas station. They followed me down the street a little bit, but I swerved last minute into a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store with a lot of people, and they left me alone. I cried on the phone to my friend and drove to her place. I quit lift driving after that. I don't know what their intentions were, but they surely weren't good. Ladies, if you feel something's wrong, listen to your gut and get the hell out of whatever situation you're in. No ifs, and no buts. To give you some backstory, I'm from a small town of about 3,000 people. However, we are just 15 minutes away from a D1 SEC school, and huge towns next to us. We also get the property tax from a neighboring town, and have a million dollar school. I played football for my high school and actually ended up taking the receiver's coach's daughter to my senior prom. I started talking to her about midway through my senior year and she was a sophomore. Her parents never knew much about it, but I knew they knew we were a thing. The summer before college, things shot bad. It was just a rough time and things ended. So come freshman year, my ex texts my mum asking how I am. So come freshman year, my ex-girlfriend's mum texted me on Facebook asking how I am, the coach's wife. The conversation continues and ends about an hour later, just seemingly a checkup. The next day passes, another message, and longer conversation. I don't want to be rude and say leave me alone, so I just keep replying. This goes on and on until she tells me she has feelings for me and wants me. So not only did the coach's daughter want me, so did his wife. Now, if that is not some lifetime drama stuff in real life, I don't know what is. In university, I worked a summer job at an old small town theater. It was a bit of a tourist attraction 
and like many theatres, there were ghost stories attached to it. This theatre has even been featured in a couple of ghost stories, books and TV shows. I had spent months of my life in this building, and never experienced anything. So, I just took it for bullshit, like most theatre superstitions. In the mornings when I would go to work, I'd come in through the main lobby doors, and then walk down the seating aisle of the theatre, towards the stage of the stairwell that led to the basement, where the dressing rooms and offices were. I never bothered to turn the lights on, despite the room being very dark. There were no windows, and there was only ambient glow from the exit signs. I knew the path, and having worked in dark theatres for years, I have pretty good night vision. One morning, I walk in the door, and I'm about to step into the theatre, and for some reason I just couldn't do it. I was suddenly terrified to walk into the room. Just looking into the dark gave me goosebumps, and I felt like I would cry. I couldn't explain it. I ended up turning on every single light in the theatre, before I would even step foot in it. This became my new habit for the rest of my time I worked there.